Many people on carnivore diets resolve gas, bloating, constipation, mm -hmm. painful symptoms, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Sure. These are commonly resolved on carnivore diets. So, and no one has demonstrated that a lack of fiber leads to inflammation in the gut. Welcome to Black Belt Beauty Radio, a podcast fueled by a passion to support your journey in developing your most beautiful and optimal performance in life. Each episode is driven with the intention to elevate your mind. When we elevate our mind, we elevate our life. So get ready. It's time to rise. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Black Belt Beauty Radio. Today's guest is Dr. Paul Saladino. Paul is the leading authority on the science and application of the carnivore diet. He is board certified in psychiatry and completed residency at the University of Washington. He attended medical school at the University of Arizona, where he worked with Dr. Andrew Wow, focusing on integrative medicine and nutritional biochemistry. His new incredible book called The Carnivore Code just came out last month and has been climbing towards a bestseller. It may already be by the time this episode comes out. So Paul is a lot of fun. He's super charismatic. He's full of energy and very passionate about living what he calls a radical life through movement, spending time in nature and cultivating mindfulness. This conversation is science heavy people. So be ready. We get down on so much insightful information, such as Paul's backstory and how he arrived to the carnivore diet, his experience doing a vegan diet, his hypothesis behind proposed issues in digesting meat, why being intentional with your diet is so important, why it's so important to regard the history of meat eating and its valuable play on optimizing our health and longevity, why having an acidic stomach is essential for healthy digestion and overall health, the essential mineral we all need to support optimal acidity, the difference between the nutrient bioavailability in plant foods versus animal foods, some of the anti-nutrients that are in plants, what does a carnivore diet entail and his breakdowns on the different degrees of it, his hypothesis on why he believes plants are actually fallback foods, how eating meat helped our brains to develop, how to correctly eat a carnivore diet for optimal health, the flaw of epidemiology studies, who he thinks the carnivore diet is for. We talk about fiber and what your microbiome goes through on the carnivore diet. We discuss polyphenols. So what are they and how do they play a role on our health? We talked about so much, you guys. There's so much more that I didn't even list off there. Um, he is just a wealth of incredible knowledge. It's gnarly. Okay, so a few things I wanna note here before I hit play on our talk. One of the things I love so much about having a podcast that is geared to optimize self-development, life performance, and health is that I get to bring on real experts like Paul who can speak with evidence-based information on subjects that I personally want to learn more about in the health and wellness space. So in my opinion, you guys, if we want to continue our growth in life and accelerate our greatest performance throughout it, it's really important that we keep an open mind, even on subjects like this for some people. I mean, honestly, I never would have imagined, you know, uh, three years ago that I would be having a conversation around the carnivore diet. You know, I didn't eat meat for 15, 16 years, whatever it was. And I had to, you know, I started again two years ago when I found out I was anemic. And honestly, I just learned a lot about meat in particular uh, that, you know, I just, I felt like it was the best thing to do for my health. And it certainly has, yeah, it's put my health on another level. So, you know, that's my personal experience. But again, the idea here is just to have an open mind because, uh, you know, it's very Bruce Lee, my soulmate. You know, Bruce Lee says, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, add what is uniquely your own. But I think what's important about that is, you know, you don't want to be closed off from learning more things. You know, when you learn it, then you can decide, is this best for me or not? 
you know, there's so many people that are thriving on the carnivore diet now more and more. So my goal with this episode is to bring you the most scientific based information on this diet through Paul's incredible expertise in this area, because it may be useful to some of you. I will say, moving forward on all health and diet talks, this episode is meant to educate, not to prescribe. That is solely for your doctor. So you guys, I genuinely love this talk with Paul. It was a lot of fun. Uh, My brain was just like super lit. And I really do think that regardless of your diet preferences, you will appreciate this conversation too. So without further ado, here is my talk with Dr. Paul Saladino, the carnivore MD. Enjoy. Dude, we're rolling. Um, so what'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> I already asked you first. Damn it. It's true, you guys. He beat you to the question. Um, I had some grass-fed bison uh, with a couple of six-minute eggs, some avocado, and my favorite, baro nuts. Some plants. Some plant nuts. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, maybe after this podcast, you'll reconsider those. Possibly, which I'm very excited about this idea of like, I'm about to have my mind so open. Well, let's be real. My mind is already fucking open. We've had like three podcasts already. Yeah. We've gotten to like lift and hang out and yeah. went to Bel Campo last night for dinner with a bunch of my team. And yeah, we've just been rapping about all kinds of good stuff. But What's so interesting about this for me, and this has come up a lot in our pre-podcast conversations, is conditioning Mm -hmm. and how much human conditioning plays into the food choices we make and what we consider to be good, bad, gross, not gross, right? So I will share with you what I ate for breakfast and with the listeners, and um, it may elicit some ideas of, ooh, that's gross. Right. And I think that a lot of what we're going to talk about in this podcast may elicit similar emotions in people. And these are emotions. And and they're emotions that are tied with thoughts, but I think that these are emotions, and these emotions generally come from conditioning. So it's so interesting for me about what we're going to talk about today, which is a carnivore diet or sort of the way that I see the health landscape and where humans have come from and what we should be eating and what things bring us health and what things might be decreasing our health that we're unaware of is that it's all framed within this context of conditioning and how much conditioning is gonna, can get in our way of being open-minded and seeing this. So I'll do my best, I'll do my darndest during this podcast to help people kind of step outside of that conditioning Mm -hmm. and think about where it's handicapping us. Because I think that regardless of the dietary choices we make, that is a valuable exercise in everything in our life. Because there are are so many things that we do in our lives that are limited by our conditioning. Mm-hmm. And um, the and by conditioning, I mean the lives we've led, the things we've been told, the patterns we're used to seeing. But when we think about that on a grander scale, things start to look a little differently. So we went to the gym and worked out this morning and I hadn't eaten any breakfast. When I get up in the morning, I usually have about two to three grams of Redmond sea salt and some water. Mm-hmm. And then um, after that, we cooked some food. And I had um, grass-fed, grass-finished um, tenderloin from White Oak Pastures, which is an amazing farm in Georgia, which we can talk about doing regenerative agriculture, which is agriculture that actually increases the amount of carbon in the soil, increases the amount of organic matter in the soil. So that is a huge, huge fascination of mine and something I'm super passionate about, this way of raising animals that has been shown to decrease carbon emissions overall, to sequester carbon, and to increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. As we talked about, soil health, I think, is the most important metric that we can look at moving forward for the health and longevity of the human species. Humans will be extinct within a a finite number of generations if we do not give more attention to the health of our soil. And that doesn't sound super sexy, but we'll get into it later. It's pretty sexy. Um, So I had grass-fed, grass-finished tenderloin from this regenerative farm in Georgia, And I paired that with a very intentionally uh, prepared, so I had some raw fat from the animal. So also from that same farm in Georgia, which is white oak, I had grass-fed, grass-fed fat, which is the trimmings of the animal. A lot of times when people are making steaks, we're not aware that there's this fat on the steak that's trimmed off. But I eat that steak because I think a lot about fat to protein ratios. I eat that fat. Mm -hmm. So I had some grass-fed fat. And then I had some organs. And this is where people, I think, are going to have the conditioning kick in. We're not used to eating organs. Interestingly, you shared that in your history, growing up in your family, which is Persian, Mm -hmm. 
your mom already likes me yeah. because <laughs> I eat organs, right? Yeah. And she was saying that you guys ate organs growing up. And in, in many cultures throughout the world that are not found in Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. or the United States of America, eating organ meats of animals is treasured and relished and provides lots of important nutrients. As listeners of this podcast may know from your intro, I am a doctor very interested in how we become the best humans we can. And I have this contrarian idea that animal foods should form the majority of our diet. And in those animal foods, we are not limiting ourselves exclusively to steaks. That is a very bad idea. We are including organ meats, specifically liver and others. So this morning, I didn't have any liver, so I had to go a little further down <laughs> the organ meat rabbit hole. And I had some spleen, I had some pancreas, and I had some kidney. <laughs> and if, you know, so I'll just challenge the listener right now, like, listen to your conditioning kick in. Mm -hmm. If that sounds gross to you, then realize that it's not nearly as radical as the standard American diet is relative to what our ancestors used to eat. There's nothing really, quote, radical about eating animal organs. Indigenous cultures throughout the world eat animal organs and are well known to do this. And so what is most radical in the worst sense of that word, that's one of my favorite words, by the way. I know, it's a great word. It's a great word. Um, but that's one of the, in the worst sense of the word radical, the deviation of our current diet as a whole, mm -hmm. as westernized people, specifically people living in the United States, from an ancestral diet, that is much more radical, but it's much more different, that is much more disparate than um, me eating organ meats. I, I see that as a, um, a respectable sort of recapitulation, a respectable return to a pattern that we have always had, but we've forgotten about. Well, and, you know... <laughs> What I said when you busted out your organs, basically, and had, you know, all this stuff out there, it, I told you, I said, that, while it may not be something that I want to indulge in right now, like, I'm good on the spleen right now, thank you so much, but it, it that actually does not gross me out or make me feel, you know, impacted in that kind of way, like, ver in comparison to the center aisles of the standard grocery store across America. That shit right there, that I feel in my gut, like, oh, because it's just chemical after chemical and processed. And it's just a complete assault to our biology. So I, it's important for me to say that, too, because I'm not all carnivore. I mean, meat, me, animal products really are a big part of my diet now more than, you know, recent years. Um you know, and I, I know a lot of listeners, you know, eat their plants. I probably have a lot of vegans as well. And so I, I, I want to put emphasis on, you know, also just really how you started the podcast. It's like having an open mind to just take in the science and step away from the conditioning and, you know. The vegans learn. might be triggered listening to this. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's fine because, you know, listen, I've said this many times, like, I'm not here to make everyone feel great or be on everyone's side. I mean, like you're going to offend somebody no matter what. So, you know, the goal with this podcast, everyone who listens, it's how do I turn my best into better? How do I optimize myself so that I can live from the highest, the fullest expression of myself, live a life that feels fucking good. You know, like I want to be on fire in the later decades of my life. Cognitively, I want to be able to just keep putting my luggage over you know, the, in the top compartment of a plane, like when I'm in my sixties and say, so I don't, I don't want to have help, you know, and not because I don't, you know, have a problem with getting help. It's because I believe that, you know, I'm designed to be capable to do that. You know, I feel yeah. the same way. I mean, that's my, that's my goal as well to be surfing when I'm 90 and dancing and just yes. kicking ass for as long as I possibly can. Yes. I love it. So just a little backstory for mm. our listeners. So you haven't been carnivore your whole life, right? No. Okay. Can we, let's bring them up to speed a little bit because you're an incredible doctor. I mean, for those who are not dialed into you yet, I have to say, you know, researching you and thank you, Gabrielle, I love you because you always connect me with amazing people. Um, it's just been so fun to take deep dives into your work and, and what you're sharing. You know, a lot, man. And it's a lot of important, again, like whether I'm ready to go all in or not, I'm very open and I'm interested in 
how do I become better constantly? And so it's been so cool to learn more about you and take in what you're sharing. So if you can, you know, share a little bit about your backstory and how you arrived to this place, I think it would be rad for our listeners. Yeah. And there goes that word again, rad. I'm a, I'm a big rad person. Let's FYI. Just stay as rad <laughs> as possible. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I, um, you know, I grew up in a medical family. My dad's a doctor and my mom's a nurse. And I was always sort of fascinated by what was causing illness. And for whatever reason, things kind of coalesced for me. And um, I've been obsessed with understanding the roots of illness my whole life. I, you know, when I was going to the hospital with my dad, I just wanted to know what was causing it. And I went to college at William and Mary. I studied chemistry and biology and I did really well and I got really burned out. And so after college, I took six years off and was a ski bum and traveled all over the world. I was in New Zealand. I through hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, which goes from Mexico to Canada. I spent a lot of time in the wilderness. That shaped me very deeply. And at the end of that six years, I realized I didn't want to work in bike shops my whole life. I actually really liked biology. I wanted to return to medicine. But I'd seen my dad work as a physician and not really been able to be able to maintain work-life balance. So I thought being a physician assistant might be a good medium ground. And I went to PA school. So I worked as a PA in cardiology for four years. And pretty quickly at the beginning of that four years, I realized this was not going to be the end of the road for me in terms of a career because I saw firsthand at that point that Western medicine, symptom-focused, pharmaceutical-based medications do not treat the root cause of a symptom, do not treat the root cause of an illness. They only ameliorate them, right? And often it's like a game of whack-a-mole where you hit the mole and another one pops up somewhere else. You give someone a medication, no matter what specialty you're in, and another symptom pop, pops up, right? I can give someone a beta blocker, which might help with their hypertension, but then it's going to cause erectile dysfunction, or it's going to cause depression, or it's going to cause them to have be short of breath, right? Mm -hmm. Or I can give them X, Y, or Z drug, and it might treat something, but something else is going to happen because I'm not treating the root cause. Mm -hmm. And that infuriated me. That really didn't sit well with me, and I knew that... You know, that was the type of medicine that I wanted to do was root cause medicine. There's lots of words for this these days. Yeah. Functional medicine, integrative medicine. I don't like any of those words because they sort of silo you as a, they pigeonhole you within a certain frame of reference. I'm a doctor. I, I don't even know that I necessarily think of myself as a doctor. I think of myself now more as an explorer who went to medical school. I'm a curious person who went to medical school and has an MD after his name and did a residency. Society calls me a doctor. I don't like labels like that, right? I'm just a curious explorer. You know, 100 years ago, you know, 150 years ago, I would have been on the Lewis Clark expedition, like <laughs> as a stowaway. You know, I just want to see stuff. I want to see stuff. You know, I, I wanted to see the world. I That's wanted to so see, cool. I did the Pacific Crest Trail. You know, I, I want to see mountains. I want to go up mountains. I want to ski down them. I want to go in the ocean and see waves. And I want to explore the realms of what the heck is making people sick and how do we get them better? And I've been thinking about that for a long time. And so... I went into medical school after PA school thinking that I need to go back, get my doctoral degree, and then do residency so I have full autonomy to do this. And through that process, I'd been kind of dealing with medical issues that were driving my own iterations of my diet, trying to figure out what is it in my diet that's causing my medical issues. Specifically, I had eczema. That was pretty bad. Yeah. And as we talked about, I started doing jujitsu mm -hmm. in medical school, and at times, the, the eczema got really bad. And I don't think that, I do not believe that jujitsu causes eczema, right? Mm -hmm. But if you are on a jujitsu mat with bare elbows and knees, you are going to get bad eczema, right? Yeah. There is underlying inflammation. There's underlying autoimmunity in a, someone that has an autoimmune condition like eczema or psoriasis and certain things may trigger it. But the jujitsu did not cause the eczema, right? Mm -hmm. My diet caused the eczema was what I believed. And I was trying to figure out what in my diet was causing it. And at that point I'd been paleo, mm -hmm. So no grains, no beans, no dairy for many, many years. And I still was having severe, severe eczema to the point that it got so bad a few times I had to have antibiotics. At one point I had to have IV antibiotics because I got septic, it got infected with impetigo. It was pretty bad. Wow. So the eczema was bad. And I was thinking, well, here I am eating a diet that most people would consider to be very healthy, paleo diet. And listeners will also benefit from knowing that much earlier in my life, I had done a plant-based diet. I did a full raw vegan diet wow. for seven months, um, probably six years prior to this point in medical school. And that didn't help my eczema either. My eczema got worse. So you were just playing with these diets to experience what the kind of biofeedback, like what would happen to you? Is that where you, like, why did you go raw and vegan? Where did that come from? Was it just? I was conditioned. I mm. bought into the propaganda, you know? That was at the beginning of my time as a PA, and I was introduced to work of David Wolf and other people who were saying that cooking food is dangerous. And mm. 
I kind of bought in. I didn't do my own research, right? I was swayed. This is years before the Game Changers documentary, which <laughs> I think is equally... Documentary? I think Gabrielle... Not not a yeah. documentary. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think fic- she's actually on the money with it. It's not a real documentary. <laughs> it's a f- yeah. fictional story. It's like an entertainment story, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the Game Changers movie. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I there there are there are persuasive arguments that people can make for plant-based diets. And at the time I was persuaded and I tried it and I lost 25 to 30 pounds of muscle mass. So I'm, mm. I'm 30 pounds heavier now mm. of muscle mass. I'm not an obese person. So right. um, I'm 30 pounds more muscle now than I was on a vegan diet. And I, my eczema got worse. I had bad gas. I was a horrible person to be around in a small room like this. You would not have wanted to sit with me, <laughs> nor did anybody want to sit with me at work. Okay. So a vegan diet was horrible for me. Yeah. And uh, after that, I began a paleolithic diet and then fast forward to medical school. I'm still having eczema on a paleo diet and thinking, man, this is the diet that people, most people think is healthy, right? It's some healthy red meat, it's some healthy chicken, and it's basically vegetables. Mm-hmm. But the eczema isn't going away. And sometimes it's getting really bad. And at that point, I started, I just kept iterating and I started taking things out low oxalate, low histamine, low salicylate, low lectin, no nightshades, blah, blah, blah. And that, Sorry, can you just for the listener, these are things that exist in plants oxalates, spinach, kale. Would you call them an anti nutrient? Absolutely. Okay, cool. These just plant- because some people are like, I don't even know what that is, you know? Yeah, yeah. So these yeah. are all different things that can occur in plants. I mean, mm-hmm. histamines can occur in animal foods as well, but there are some plant foods that are felt to be higher histamine than other plant foods. And oxalic acid, we can talk about oxalate, is a mm-hmm. dicarboxylic acid. So it's a two carbon carboxylic acid molecule that is made in high amounts in plants and very small amounts in humans. Human biology creates oxalic acid as a byproduct of the breakdown of two molecules, glyoxalate and hydroxyproline. And then it's excreted in amounts around 10 to 30 milligrams a day. But eating a decent amount of spinach, you can get between 500 and 1,000 milligrams a day. So you can 10x, 20x your oxalate intake just by eating foods that are ostensibly thought to be healthy from the plant kingdom. Salicylates are derived from salicylic acid. These are It's a plant hormone. Again, these can trigger reactions. This is another sort of plant defense molecule. There are plants that are high in salicylates. Avocado, coconut are high in salicylates. Mm -hmm. Lectins are uh, carbohydrate binding proteins, something that was popularized by Stephen Gundry. Mm -hmm. I've been on his podcast and debated him because we disagree very sharply about the utility of animal foods in the human diet. And um, and so I've, I've debated him on that quite extensively. But he did advance the notion with his book, The Plant Paradox, people may be familiar with it there, he wasn't the first person to do this, that these carbohydrate binding proteins found in plants could create autoimmunity in humans. And there's pretty good evidence for that that I talk about in my book, yeah. which is called The Carnivore Code. It's sitting here <laughs> it's between- It's such a badass yeah, cover. Yeah, it's an amazing cover. Hopefully you can post about that. Of so, course. Um, for people that are listening to this, the book will be out in mid-February. It's amazing. And oh, yeah. I hope you'll all check it out. There's going to be a full blast for me on this. Blast. I'm, yeah, I'm putting this out there. Blast the book. Okay, so <laughs> in the book, I talk about lectins and all these things. So I was going through my diet, cutting these things out, trying to see if it would help. And sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. And then in, fast forward to residency. At one point in residency, I mean, the eczema got so bad. I had like a tramp stamp of eczema. It was a really, <laughs> it was a really big back tattoo of eczema, you know, the size of like a football on my back and pretty bad weeping and very, un- and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing? What is going on here? Uh, specifically in that instance, this is relevant to you and um, a conversation that we had earlier today. I was doing high doses of medicinal mushrooms, taking like mm. tablespoon quantities of chaga or reishi and these mushrooms. So the adaptogen mushrooms. The adaptogen mushrooms love, that yeah. are that are actually pretty darn high in yeah. uh, chaga has a decent amount of oxalate and other things. And <laughs> these can definitely have lectin molecules in them. So even mushrooms can do this to people. Mm-hmm. So I had a friend who had autoimmune disease and he said, I heard about this thing called a carnivore diet and I'm going to do it. And I was like, you're crazy. And so if anyone listening to this thinks that the idea of a carnivore diet, which we'll break down in more detail later, is crazy, you're in good company because I thought it was the same way. I thought it was crazy when I heard of it too. But because my friend had autoimmune disease and we'd been trying to brainstorm about this, I did some research. And the more I looked into it, the more I was kind of intrigued by this notion that Perhaps what I'd been missing throughout all of my iterations was the fact that plants inherently have toxins. Mm -hmm. And we enumerated some of those, only a fraction. There are even more toxins from plants, tannins, you know, isothiocyanates, polyphenols. These are phytoalexin molecules 
that plants use as defense chemicals. And there's a lot to unpack there because people yeah. generally hear polyphenol is a good thing. Right, My, myself included. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can unpack all that, but there are lots of toxins in plants. There are lots of things in plants that could trigger our immune system in humans. And so what I did, I, eventually, you know, I, I did some research on this and I thought, I can get all of the nutrients that I need to function optimally as a human from animals. I could look at the nutrition textbooks and realize that. Like you can get every vitamin and mineral that you need in animal foods. If you eat nose to tail, if you eat the liver and the heart and the spleen, you know, you can get everything you need. And that makes sense because an animal looks a lot like a human. Mm -hmm. An animal looks a lot more like a human than a plant. Broccoli. Than broccoli does. Yeah. And we have the same operating systems. Yeah. And even vitamin C, and people may not know this, but there is vitamin C present in animal foods in pretty reasonable amounts. You can pretty uh, easily get to the recommended daily allowance for vitamin C by eating animal foods. Okay. It's never been measured by the USDA, but in independent analyses, and there's published papers showing that there's vitamin C in muscle meat, there's vitamin C in organs, there's vitamin C in throughout the animal. And so again, I'll reiterate, if you look at the nutritional textbooks, if you really dig into nutrition, Humans can get every single nutrient, vitamin and mineral that they need to function optimally from animal foods. Mm -hmm. And the asterisk on that statement is that there are many nutrients in animal foods that we need to function optimally. Mm -hmm. Creatine, choline, carnitine, carnosine, taurine, B12, K2, which do not occur in plants at all. Yeah. And when I realized that, I thought, wait a minute, why am I eating plants in the first place? Mm -hmm. And I'll throw it back to you in a little bit and kind of ask you that question, no, you know, yeah. why do people eat plants in the first place? And we can address fiber and polyphenols and, oh, yeah. and nutrients, but at a very basic micronutrient level, vitamins and minerals, animal foods are clearly the king. Animal foods are clearly the most bioavailable source of everything humans need to thrive. And so I thought, well, I can get everything I need. Animal foods are basically a multivitamin. I don't need plants for anything. And at that point I was already going down the rabbit hole polyphenols and fiber, and these are not really that beneficial for humans. So I decided to do it. So I did a carnivore diet. About a year and a half, I've been doing a strict carnivore diet. And we can talk about how I eat a carnivore diet. People got a little preview of it. Wait, only a year and a half? Is mm -hmm. that, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I felt, for some reason, it just feels like it's been so much longer. I don't know. No, that's it's amazing. probably been, yeah, it's about 19 months now. Okay, So a little cool. over a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. And um, before that, I was eating paleo. So I was yeah. eating a lot of meat and a few vegetables. And yeah. again, I was cutting things out, but strict carnivore. So I have 19 months of polyphenol deficiency to show with my, <laughs> with my abs and my energy and my libido <laughs> and my, you know, my healthy skin and my yeah. regular poops and my, you know, mm -hmm. stable mood. And so I joke about this on Instagram, like, here's my polyphenol deficiency, you know, and I, I know I see it. It's funny. <laughs> I've done lots of blood work too, to prove that, you know, humans don't need polyphenols and we'll talk about it. That's a whole rabbit hole. But yeah. so what was interesting was when I started this carnivore diet within a few weeks, my eczema cleared up and it's never recurred. And other things happened that I didn't expect. So I was in Seattle for a residency at the time and my mood got better. I didn't even think that I had depression or anxiety, but suddenly I was more happy. And the um, the meter, which decides how likely I am to honk at somebody else in traffic, went way down. So the honk at someone else in traffic meter went way the heck down. I was just a much more chilled out person. And I thought, what the heck is this about? Like I'm getting psychological effects from eliminating plants. I never expected this. I never expected this. I need to dive into this. And that was the beginning of sort of the deep dive, which led to the book. I have a podcast now. It's not just about carnivore, but I have a podcast. I mean, you're the carnivore MD. Let's be real. Yes. Like you are, you're, yeah. the, you're yeah. the king of this space. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been my, my sort of rabbit hole that I've gone down. And believe me, there have been lots of challenges and people can see throughout the, you know, the, um, the catalog of my work in that time, I've debated many people about this mm -hmm. in the space. I have lots of debates on my podcast, other people's podcasts, and I've gone toe to toe with people on many of these issues and sort of had to defend them. And there's lots of things we can dig into here, but that's kind of how I arrived at this. And the rest has been the last year and a half, and it's been an amazing journey. Yeah. And here I am sitting in a podcast studio. I mean, <laughs> I know. Like talking me. about eating pancreas. This is, I know. Well, and, and, you know, on the flip, it's like five years ago, because so I feel like a lot of my listeners know this by now, but you know, I only spend not even a full year and a half, um, since I've reintroduced meat into my diet and I, I, I'm not interested in bird. Um, just, I don't have any desire for it just, but red meat. We should unpack that too in a moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a very, um, I just don't want it. I don't like it. But when, so I was, you know, 
I ate fish and eggs. Um, I just cut meat out for about 15 years. And, and, and I'll just say this too, because I actually did not share this with you yet, but I did this cleanse and it was essentially like not eating basically. And then the food that I wanted after the cleanse, all I craved was vegetables. Literally, it's just like I want plant, you know? And maybe because I was, you know, missing a lot of nutrients. I don't know, whatever. But that's all I eat. So, well, we, thought, we can talk about that too. I have some theories there. Yeah, I would love to know. Well, so what ended up happening was I just found that I wasn't being called to meat, right? And then I start playing, well, I'm type A blood, blood type. I'm like the vegetarian in the, the blood chain. And right, this is, you know, I'm in my 20s. Um, and uh, so anyways, I just felt like, well, if I'm not, you know, being called to me, then my body probably fucking doesn't need it, right? Fast forward 15, 16 years, whatever it was, do my comprehensive blood labs. And and I, I should say, you know, and I shared this a little bit last night that, you know, a cup, probably like three years, maybe prior to doing this lab, just from all the investigation and the learning and getting all geeked out on biology and nutrigenomics and all this stuff, I'm like, damn, it's kind of undeniable that animal protein is superior protein and there's a lot of benefits and sometimes i wish i ate red meat and well animal food in general is superior the protein is sure. more bioavailable but the whole package yeah true i think i was only looking at yes but you're so right and then i you know do my blood labs and find out that i was anemic and I, that was just it for me i was like i'm done i'm gonna get past this you know weird part of you know my brain that's going to probably have a hard time in the beginning with you know cutting into flesh after so many years but it took it was only a few days where i was like you know enjoying it really and i grew up eating meat you know um but yeah so god how did i even get there <laughs> it happens well i think that you know hearing that story i hear i do hear a lot of conditioning you know i i want to respect the story but it is interesting to think, you know, if somebody fasts and they're not called to meet when they come back. Mm -hmm. I hear from a lot of people, um, women especially, that sometimes meat doesn't agree with them. Mm -hmm. They have trouble digesting meat. And what I talk about in the book is, I don't think this is a reaction of your body to meat. Mm -hmm. It's usually a lack of the nutrients in meat which are needed to digest food. You know what I love about that? So many people, when they found out that I was going to eat meat again, and by the way, I remembered where I wanted to go, but um, I had no issues reintroducing meat. Into oh, interesting. My body. I had no problem at all. Um, what I wanted to say was I never would have thought, you know, five years ago that I would be sitting here so open-minded and actually very eager to sit down and talk about, you know, everything that we're talking about, the carnivore diets. Just, it's awesome. Evolution is beautiful and growth, constant growth and being in the state of wanting to learn, especially for the reasons of constantly wanting to better yourself and have that impact the world in a, you know, positive way. That's what it's about. If we stagnate yeah. any of us, then, you know, we're kind of stuck. We're never going to grow. And right. I like your slogan, you know, turning, best turning your best into better, turning your best into better. A lot of us don't even know how good we can be. I didn't even know how good I could be. I cut out plant foods and I was like, oh man, like my mental state is even better than I thought. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people live in that state. They they maybe even be they may even be eating processed food or some bread or some gluten or, you know, beer occasionally or alcohol mm -hmm. occasionally. And they they just you can't even really distinguish the way that those foods are affecting you until you cut them out. I which agree. is why I uh, appreciate and give a virtual high five to anyone that makes an intentional dietary choice, whether that's vegan, vegetarian carnivore, paleo, whatever, make an intentional dietary choice. Don't stay asleep and then look at how that affects your body and know that whatever you do, you should do labs, you should check energy levels and you should compare because I'm going to tell you that a carnivore diet is, in my opinion, the optimal diet for humans. There's lots of other very persuasive people who I would love to debate and never show up to debate me <laughs> um, that say a plant-based diet is is optimal. And unfortunately, we can just see if we can go into the some of the misleading stuff that plant-based rhetoric that's used. But most of the time when people are trying to um, push plant-based diets, they're using only epidemiology studies. Mm -hmm. They're using literature that is a survey study rather than an interventional study. And if we really dig into it and look at the literature, which is what's so hard for the lay person to do who's not a physician or very interested in nutrition, mm -hmm. they can be misled. They can be misled by fancy drama movies like Game yeah. Changers. And that makes me a little bit frustrated. And that's kind of why I'm on this path to exonerate meat at a, at a broad level 
What I am so excited about now is telling people meat is incredibly healthy for you, whether it's red meat, fish, chicken, whatever. It's all very healthy for humans. It has formed the center of our diet as humans throughout our evolution. That's almost indisputable. And we can talk about evolution of humans and the size of the human brain yes. if you want. But meat has formed a, an irreplaceable part of our diet throughout our evolution to forego that now based on rhetoric that is misleading from plant-based pundits is just absurd. Yeah. And I think that all many people need to do is look at the doctors who are promoting this plant-based diet. Look at Michael Greger, look at Joel Furman, look at some of these other guys, look at Neil Barnard. They are stick figures. <laughs> they have a neck which you would break in a second if you guillotine <laughs> them, right? Yeah. Like you could, they, they are so, they have so much sarcopenia. You know, Gabrielle Lyon would go crazy. These guys cannot maintain muscle mass. Yeah. And then look at, who knows what their labs look like and how nutrient deficient they are. But anyway, so the idea here, I think, is that we are considering which diet is optimal for humans. And in my life, it was, hey, I'm going to try a vegetarian diet. I'm going to try a vegan diet. That didn't work for me. My eczema continued. I'm going to try paleo. That didn't work for me. I'm going to cut out plants. Mm -hmm. Eczema gets better. Mood gets better. I go down the rabbit hole. And what I find is just so freaking striking. And your story is interesting as well. And I think there is, like I said, there's some conditioning there. Yeah. And it's interesting that you were only craving vegetables. My hypothesis, which could be wrong, was that if you are nutrient depleted, a lot of people, and I wanted to make this point, a lot of times people don't digest red meat well. Mm -hmm. And you can get, if you get, if you are zinc deficient, mm -hmm. then you may not make enough hydrochloric acid in your stomach. And that is what is needed to digest meat and protein. And we should have a very acidic stomach. An acidic stomach is needed to be a healthy human. Yeah. We know that there are these drugs, proton pump inhibitors that raise the acidity or make our stomachs more alkaline. And those are associated with all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. Pneumonia, dementia later in life. It's a horrible idea to have a more alkaline stomach. Right. But where do you get zinc from? And this is an illustration of the concept that I was mentioning. Like you get zinc from animals. Mm -hmm. There are very few sources of zinc in the plant kingdom and they are very poorly bioavailable. We were talking about this earlier about the bioavailability of nutrients in plant foods is the sort of great leveler that is never talked about. You can look at a label, for instance, of your Baruca nuts yeah. and it says, oh, it has 15% of your RDA for magnesium. Mm -hmm. How much of that is bioavailable? Very little. Because in nuts and seeds and many plants, minerals, specifically divalent cations, magnesium, calcium, strontium, selenium, zinc, uh, iron, are complexed to molecules that chelate them. They bite them. Oxalic acid, phytic acid. And this decreases the bioavailability of these minerals. I was describing to you a study involving oysters because it was interesting to me. You were eating a buffalo burger with these Baruca nuts. And I said, you are decreasing your absorption of minerals from that buffalo burger by eating the nuts with it. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying that is because it mirrors a study that was done with oysters. Oysters are very high in zinc and you can give people oysters. And this is a study that's been done clinically. And you can see blood levels of zinc rise very sharply. And then you can give people oysters with black beans. And the peak, the rise in blood levels of zinc is cut in half. And then you can give people oysters with beans and tortillas, two foods which have oxalic acid and phytic acid, and there is no change in the blood levels of zinc, meaning the anti-nutrients in those plant foods completely abolished the absorption of zinc. So yeah. it's basically, we have to think about the bioavailability of nutrients in plant versus animal foods. Minerals are very bioavailable in animal foods. Yeah. There's heme iron, which is iron complex to a porphyrin ring. It goes right across our gut. And for those who are anemic, that is the answer. Like you need heme iron. You need animal form iron. Right. Naked iron in plants doesn't really get into the body that well. It's very hard to get enough iron from plants. And many in vegan and vegetarian circles who do not use iron supplements will become deficient in iron right. for a variety of reasons, specifically these chelating molecules, phytic acid, oxalic acid, and the fact that the iron in plants is very poorly bioavailable. Mm -hmm. Moving out of the mineral category, we can look at vitamins. B12, right? <clears throat> That's a huge one, right? B12 does not exist in plants. Right. It does not exist in That's plants. It's such an important vitamin. Oh, it's a hugely important vitamin, right? It does not exist in plants. It does not exist in soil. James Wilkes incorrectly talked about that in an episode of, of Joe Rogan. There are B12 analogs in soil which have no biological vi viability. And then James Wilkes, who is from the Game Changers, has also claimed that you can get B12 by eating vegetables that are not washed. The study he's referring to looked at indigenous people eating vegetables grown in human poop. 
Oh, wow. If you eat your own poop, that's a good source of B12 because B12 is made in your gut and you can recycle it. But if we are eating vegetables that are not washed, that are not grown in human feces, which is probably the vegetables we should be eating. Right. Right. <laughs> you're not going to get enough B12, right? You will not prevent B12 deficiency by doing that. Yeah. And there's no significant amount of B12 in water supplies. That's an, it's a fallacy that he's also tried to promulgate. So humans cannot live without B12. B12 is only found in animals. And then you think about other nutrients that are found in both plant and animal foods. And animal forms are so much more efficacious, potent, and bioavailable. Specifically, we can think about vitamin A, mm -hmm. which is retinol. Retinol does not occur in plant foods. It's only beta carotene. Well, beta carotene is a dimer of two retinol molecules, and you have to cleave it down the middle to make retinol vitamin A. Many people are very poor at doing that if they have polymorphisms and specific enzymes named BCMO. Mm -hmm. And so beta carotene in the literature is felt to be 121st as potent as one molecule of retinol vitamin A. So I'll rephrase that. In order to get the biological equivalency of one molecule of retinol vitamin A that you would find in liver, for instance, or in egg yolk, you have to get 21 molecules of beta carotene. But on food labels, beta carotene is equated with vitamin A one to one. Oh, interesting. But it's not the same biological value. This happens yeah. all the time because plant protein is equated with animal right. protein one to one. But we right. know if we look at things like the DIAS score, uh -huh. the digestible indispensable amino acid score, that plant protein is much less bioavailable. Right. And there's never a correction for this on any nutritional label. So if you look at a carrot, a label of carrots, it'll tell you how much vitamin A is in there, divide it by 21. Because that's all beta carotene. And your body has to convert it. And those are only worth 121st as much as vitamin A, vitamin A from animal foods. Wow. So if you want to get enough vitamin A, you need to eat, to get the RDA, the recommended daily allowance of vitamin A, eating plant foods, you need to eat close to a pound of sweet potatoes per day. A pound of sweet potatoes per day. That's a lot of- Doing no one favors. That's a lot of sweet <laughs> potatoes, right? Yeah. And that is the highest beta carotene food, right? Right, you, right. You'll go down, you'll, you'll have many, that's the highest beta carotene vegetable. You have to eat a pound of- sweet potatoes per day. Wow. To get the RDA for choline, which is a critical nutrient for brain development, membranes of every cell in the body. And I feel like, did I hear somewhere that a lot of people have a deficiency or are just not getting adequate oh, amounts of so choline? So many people are deficient yeah. in choline, yeah. yeah. Phosphatidylcholine is part of every membrane in every cell. Mm -hmm. Choline is part of the acetylcholine neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. In order to get enough choline from plant foods, you have to eat almost a pound of broccoli, which is the highest amount of choline in plant foods, right? So between a pound of broccoli and a pound of sweet potatoes every day, what is left for you to eat if you are eating plants? And we haven't even got, that's only two nutrients. Right. That's right. only two nutrients. Then we can go to others, creatine, choline, carnosine, carnitine, taurine, B12, K2. We'll go through all of them. Yeah. Creatine, not found in plant foods, only found in animal foods. There are interventional studies with vegans and vegetarians where they give these people creatine. Mm. They get smarter, meaning that they are yeah. not performing to their potential right. by not eating animal foods. You yeah. give them five grams, or in this one study, they gave them 20 grams of creatine for five days to load them. They got smarter, working memory tasks, recall. They got better when they got 20 grams of creatine because they're deficient. And this has been documented for every one of these cases I talk about it in the book. Vegans and vegetarians have lower levels of zinc, vitamin A, et cetera, iron, yeah. creatine. When you give them these things, they do better. Mm -hmm. Another one that's very important is vitamin K2. People may or may not be familiar with this. It's a little technical. There's K1 and K2. If you look at animal foods on USDA-based databases, they will say there is no vitamin K. Yeah, because there is no vitamin K1, okay. which is phyloquinone. Okay. But vi animal foods are very rich in vitamin K2, which is menaquinone. There are multiple chain lengths of menaquinones, MK4 to MK13. But menaquinones, vitamin K2, are what have been basically very clearly shown to have improvements in cardiovascular health when we consume them. And vitamin K1 does not show the same benefit. So we're very poor at converting K1 to K2. Mm -hmm. But... There, I don't believe there are any unique biological roles for vitamin K1, which is plant vitamin K in the human body. And there's a great study called the Rotterdam study. Mm -hmm. It's an epidemiology study, admittedly, but it looked at vitamin K2 levels in the diet of people. And there's a clear progression. As we get more vitamin K2, there is less incidence of coronary heart disease and less incidence of aortic valve calcification. Very clear. And so, but there is no association in that study between vitamin K1 intake. So where, where do we get vitamin K2? Yeah. Predominantly from animal foods. Can you make an example? Because I actually supplement K2. So what would be the... 
So you get Is it, it from that liver. Okay. You get it from liver and egg yolks. There's a little bit in muscle meat, chicken, things like this. So you can get plenty of K2 in animal foods. You don't need to supplement K2 if you're eating a lot of animal foods, but animal foods are the main source of K2. We can get it from natto, but it's only a specific metaquinone. Okay. I believe natto is MK7 and animal foods give us MK4, MK11, the whole range. So you can get vitamin K2 in natto, but who who eats natto? Yeah, no. I mean, I'm a cringing. Just, yeah, like, I've never even tried it, but what I've heard, I'm like, eh. Well, and then you can think like natto is fermented soybeans, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. Then we have all the other problems right, with right, soy. Right, 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 right. Xenoestrogens, endocrine disruptors. Soy is very high in phytic acid. In, yep. in fact, soy is the highest, one of the highest foods in terms of phytic acid, which is this chelating molecule that prevents minerals from getting into the body. So you you can't just, there's no there's no solution to the conundrum by eating plant foods. You can try and piece it together with Band-Aids and popsicle sticks and glue and try and get some nutrition out of it. <laughs> but it just works so much better when we eat animal foods. We get all the nutrients we need in the most bioavailable forms. So can we, I don't want to cut you off, but I just, I feel like maybe it's a good place to, can you elaborate a little bit? Like when we say the carnivore diet, let's talk a little bit about like, what does this even mean? Right. right. It, it's the car carnivore sounds so aggressive, doesn't it? Right. right. I mean, it's good. Really, I know. <laughs> <laughs> good. It's like, I, I, we learned this morning, there's no problem with aggression here. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to win this battle. <laughs> um, but I think it could be helpful. Um, Let's define to, it. Yeah. So I, there are, there are a couple of ways to think about the carnivore diet. The, the more broad way, part of my message, that's like the broader message is realizing that animal foods are the best source of nutrients for humans. And also realizing that plant foods Plants exist to survive as well, and that plant foods are full of toxins, and that plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity, okay? So in the book, I have five tiers of system of carnivore diets to help people kind of ease into this way of eating. And the easiest tier, the first tier, is called carnivore-ish. I actually know what your diet is because we talked about it a lot today, and you, I think that you are probably carnivore-ish. You eat... Um, if your listeners don't know, you're eating a lot of meat mm -hmm. from good sources. You're eating avocado. You're eating occasional Brussels sprouts, which we'll talk about why that's not a good thing. <laughs> and and you're eating you know eggs and you're eating baruca nuts and that that forms yeah. the majority of your diet day in and day out. Like yeah, that's I mean I love arugula too. You know, right, but all my veggies are cooked. But yeah, that's it. No starches, no greens, no dairy, no sugar. I with the occasional Hugh Kitchen chocolate <laughs> <laughs> cashews. But yeah, that's that's it. So you can think about, so no I soy. Want, and I give people a spectrum of plant toxicity in the book and things like soy. In my opinion, brassicas are pretty toxic, but so are seeds and nuts and grains and legumes mm -hmm. and nightshade vegetables. You leave all these out. So a, a carnivore-ish diet, and I think that the most approachable way to think about a carnivore diet, the best takeaway for people here is to think that animal foods are where you get the majority of your nutrients, that plants have toxins and should be, if they're going to be eaten, which we don't need to, mm -hmm. if they're going to be eaten, we must consider a spectrum of plant toxicity, know which are more and less toxic sure. and eat the less toxic plants. As you and I talked about, I really strongly believe that throughout our evolution, plants were survival foods, mm -hmm. only fallback foods. We know this looking at indigenous cultures. The more meat they could get, the more meat they ate. And by meat, I mean animal foods. So including organs and fat, nose, nose, to, tail. nose to tail eating, exactly. Yeah. And our ancestors did eat some plants. And in the book, I talk about studies suggesting that based on stable isotopes, that our ancestors actually ate a lot of animals, mostly animals. Surely throughout our evolution, we ate plants from time to time. But I really believe that they serve the best role as survival foods, fallback foods, patching the gaps. If we can't get an animal today, if you guys are, if you and I are going to go hunt, we don't get an animal today and there's some raspberries. Yeah, we'll probably eat them. Right. And if we look at the way that indigenous people throughout the world eat plants, they always detoxify them. They're mm -hmm. smart. They usually ferment them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's where sauerkraut comes from. That's right. where a lot of things come from. They, they know there are toxins in the plants and they detoxify them as much as possible. Right. And they're just basically eating the plants for calories. There's not a whole lot of micronutrients in those plants anymore when they're that processed. And there aren't really a whole lot of micronutrients in the plants that are generally eaten throughout the world. People may not know this, but broccoli is an American invention, right? Really? Yeah, you go to South America and people will be like, what the heck? Who eats broccoli? Like, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very- it's Actually, when you say that, I don't, yeah, from as someone who's lived around the world and traveled around the world. Kale is, like, actually, kale is a- Decoration for the salad bar. Kale is a front, you know? Kale is a politicized, like, kale had a publicist because 15 years ago, nobody ate kale. <laughs> And throughout the world, people do not eat kale. They just don't eat these foods, oh my right? God. If you look at the plant foods that indigenous peoples eat, you yeah. can probably pick them off the top of your head. Occasional nuts. Yeah. 
acorns and Native Americans, which they had to soak and do tons of stuff to make not toxic. Acorns are highly toxic. Mm -hmm. Occasional tubers, seasonal fruit. That's about it. They Indigenous people generally do not go out like picking leaves like a salad like we imagine they would. Yeah. This is not how they gather. They don't do this. They eat on a spectrum of plant toxicity, realizing, I believe, that there's, they're really survival foods. They don't go around picking leaves. Right. Leaves are highly toxic. You can kill yourself eating leaves right. of plant. <laughs> and generally, they taste like crap. You ever had plain kale? Um, well, yes, I have. It's so yeah. bitter. Yeah, it is. Nobody's going to eat that. Right. Like, nobody is going to eat that. And like, right. you know, there's a plant in Colorado, miner's lettuce. Maybe you could eat that. Maybe it's less toxic. But yeah. like, people are surviving on that. They're not thriving. Nobody's thriving on miner's lettuce. The other thing I'll challenge people with, and then I'll give a more technical definition of a carnivore diet, is go in the wilderness. Anyone who thinks that our ancestors ate a lot of plants, I would challenge them to go backpacking all over the world. Go backpacking near the equator, go backpacking in the mountains, go backpacking in the summer, go backpacking in the winter. Tell me how many edible plants you see that will form a good diet long term. Sure, there are plants you can eat that won't kill you on the spot, mm -hmm. but for those plants to make up the majority of your calories or for you to get the majority of your nutrients from them is completely incongruous. It doesn't happen. You can go out with someone who knows like, hey, that that cattail won't kill you. Right. Dude, you are, no one is thriving on cattail. <laughs> you know, nobody is thriving on cattail and wild strawberries. Like you can get like, they're, they're the size of my pinky nail, a wild strawberry, right? Yeah. And they're only available for a few weeks out of the year. Fruit is probably the most, uh, is probably the most calorically dense thing that we could get, Yeah. right? But it's only available rarely. And it really benefits plants more than humans. And we can talk about that too. But People want to say this, and I say, how much time have you actually spent in the wilderness? Right. I just got back from a hunting trip in West Texas. It's January. There is nothing to eat out there but deer. Yeah. Deer and pigs. Yeah. I, I, you could eat a prickly pear cactus, but that thing is full of spikes. Yeah. Like, why am I, if I am starving, I might go to eat that. But you know what else? The people who live there, the Indians who live in West Texas were called the Coyahuiltecan Indians. They also ate deer poop. Wow. Like. Is anyone going to claim that a deer poop diet is good? No, right. they're survivalists, right? Yeah. In nature, we are built to survive. We're going to eat acorns. We're going to eat deer poop. We're going to maybe eat some some cactus, but that's not the ideal food. That is fallback food. That is survival food. Yeah. And now we've been sort of sold this narrative, which I believe is incorrect, that our ancestors eat a lot of plants or that plants are the best source of nutrients when in fact it's completely wrong. So I'll go back to the original question you had, which well, was Well, so wait, good. this is a good place. And I'm not going to forget to take you back there, the definition, but just can, maybe because we're already kind of in the fields, how our brains got bigger. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's a good sweet spot. Yeah, and let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a graph in the book, and this is based on cranial vault size of humans and pre-human ancestors. So humans evolved from chimpanzees. Um, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's science, you know? And um, that happened about 4 million years ago in the East African Rift Valley when there was a tectonic shift and a set of sort of pre-human apes was forced to move into the savannah, and they became a species known as Australopithecus. And we can look at the size of Australopithecus brains, and then we can look at the next species, which is generally considered to be Homo habilis or Homo erectus, and we can look at their brains, and we can trace the size of the human brain. And so 4 million years ago, Homo Australopithecus, the brain's a little bit bigger than a primate, but not very much bigger. And the other thing I'll add is that primates preceded us for about 60 million years or more, and their brains didn't get any bigger. Eating leaves and occasional fruit for primates, they had 60 million years to grow a big brain, and it didn't do diddly, yeah. right? It yeah. didn't do anything. Like, yeah. their brains are getting bigger. And then if we look about 2 million years ago at the size of the human brain, it shoots up. It goes from 500 cc to 1,000 cc in a million years, which is a huge change, right? Because we'd had 30 million years where it didn't grow at all. Right. And then in the, in the following million years, it grew another 1,600 or 600 cc's or something like, well, I'm getting the numbers wrong. So it was 500 cc's about 2 million years ago. Then it grows about, I don't know, maybe another 500. So it doubles in size over a million years. And then it, it goes and it increases another 50% to about 1,500 or 1,600 cc's as an apex 40,000 years ago. So it goes from 500 cc, 500 ml, the size of a grapefruit to the size of a cantaloupe over the course of 2 million years, which is a massive change, yeah. whereas in the preceding 2 million years, it didn't grow at all, and in the preceding 60 million years, it didn't grow at all. So what happened 2 million years ago? There's such great evidence. There are so many pieces of evidence to suggest that we started hunting animals with success. There are bifacial tools. These are called uh, Acheulean tools. They look, if you saw this, you'd be like, that's actually, a human made that. Somebody made that. Like it looks like a, a large arrowhead. Mm -hmm. it's, a bif it's a bifacial tool, like a knife made out of a stone. 
And these are used to carve meat out of bone. You, there are cut marks on bones. Mm -hmm. And there are mass graves of animals that are about 2 million years old. And they've been herding them into blind corridors or moving them off cliffs and killing them in mass. So, And then we see changes in the human physiology, but there's anthropologic evidence that we started hunting animals at exactly that same time. Fire didn't show up until another million plus years later. Wow. We keep seeing fire a little bit later, and but we're still a million years out. Like the, the oldest fire, I think, is 750 a million years ago, mm. maybe only 500,000 years ago. It's very far after, very long after the brain started to increase. By that point, our brains were much bigger already. Yeah. And so even if we push back fire another 500,000 years and we say it's 1 million years ago, that's still a million years different from when it started. It was hunting animals that made us human, not fire, not consumption of grains, none of those things, because hunting animals gives us access to new nutrients, right? DHA, EPA, the omega-3s, zinc, iron, copper, much more minerals, many more vitamins. By the way, the DHA, the omega, like can we, that's your brain. Just, your brain is made of that. Yeah, exactly. Your brain is made of that. Just to point that out. Your brain is also made of choline in, in membranes, right? right? And all these things. And these are things we can't get at B12. Yeah. There are studies which correlate B12 levels in the blood to the size of the brain in humans that are currently living. Wow. Right? So more access to B12. Where does a monkey get B12? Monkey doesn't... A lot of them, gorillas eat their own poop, <laughs> right? So we suddenly had tons of access to B12, which is involved in methylation and the folate cycle and all these things. And this allowed our brains to grow. Hunting made us human. And there are so many things that also corroborate this. Did you know that chimpanzees don't have the white of their eye? It's black. It's brown. Well, you can try to imagine that. I'm like, okay. I'll show you a picture. Yeah. So the sclera, I'll show you a picture. The sclera, which is the white part of your eye, mm -hmm. chimpanzees don't have that. Theirs is brown. So it's felt to be an evolutionary adaptation to cooperation among humans. If I'm looking over there, you can see where I'm looking, right? Whether it's a mate, food, escape, or a prey, right? So humans are felt to be cooperative. Chimpanzees, intrinsically competitive. And what were we cooperating on? Hunting tracking things like this surviving surviving yeah. yeah so and so it also kind of lends strength to the idea that we're cooperating to hunt i'm saying let's kill this thing you know or yeah. throw your spear now or let's get the heck out of here there's a lion over there right 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 yeah so lots of adaptations but hunting animals made us human to ignore that is to ignore your biology and to become subhuman well to become suboptimal yeah so <laughs> okay i love that that's that's a, a lot of information to really think about. Whether you want to accept it or not, it's like you can't deny it. You I think just, it's pretty hard to deny it. That's mean, what I, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. So, I mean, the, the other, the alternative hypothesis would be that something else caused our brains to grow, right? right? You think sweet potatoes caused our brain to grow? Like, we've been eating stuff like that for 60 million years. Right. It wasn't access to grains. Like, chimpanzees can get roots, yeah. you know? Like, the new food that we had yeah. 2 million years ago was animals. Right. That's what caused our brain to grow. So everyone listening to this can thank animals for the brain that you have now. And like I said, there are studies in free living humans today that show that the size of the human brain is connected with B12 levels. People who have the lowest levels of B12 have smaller brains. And incidentally, what we see, the last part of that curve of human evolution in terms of the size of the brain is a decrease. Wow. In the last 40,000 years, we've seen a decline. And that correlates with the advent of agriculture. Yeah, okay. Agriculture. And oh. I talk about that in the book as well. Okay, we're going to go there. But I want to bring you right back to a more definitive, you know, understanding of what the carnivore diet is because right. it's important. So I talked about my broad definition yes. of carnivore lifestyle, carnivore-ish diet, emphasize animal foods, realize that's where you get your nutrients from and realize there's a spectrum of plant toxicity. Mm -hmm. For people who are not kicking butt doing that, who are still having autoimmune disease, inflammation, psychiatric illness, which I believe is inflammatory in nature as well you can go to what I would consider to be a true carnivore diet. And I outline this in tiers two through five in the book. And that is all animal products with no plants. And that's the way I've been eating for the last year and a half plus. Again, so here I am with my polyphenol deficiency. Yep. And that brings up all sorts of things for people. That triggers the heck out of people. Conditioning comes in like crazy. Yeah. They go crazy. They think, don't I need fiber? Don't I need polyphenols? And we can talk all about, all about that. That's but, important, yeah. Yeah, but that's a carnivore diet. It's all animal foods. Now, in the book, I recommend how I would eat a carnivore diet. I would not just eat steak. That's a horrible way to do it. Mm -hmm. I would just not, not just eat hamburger mm -hmm. and I would not just eat steak and eggs. I think we really need to think like, where are we getting our calcium from? Mm -hmm. Bone broth or bone meal, or there are other sources of calcium that we can get in our diet. I, when you make bone broth, the bones actually become kind of brittle and you can just eat them. And 
people may know this if they've had chicken wings or like a duck. When you roast a duck in the oven, the ends of the bones are trabecular, meaning they're kind of spacey, they're kind of spongy, and you can eat that. You're literally giving me a flashback, literally in this moment when I was a kid and I remember, you know, eating, we were eating meat and my parents would be like, the bone, that's like some, the most, literally saying like, that's the healthiest part or one of the, that's interesting. You got to eat the bone. Flashback. Yeah, you got to eat the bone. And so that's, that's the way I think about it. You know, eating animals nose to tail is eating bones, bone meal, bone marrow, cartilage, connective tissue, all the organs of the animal. That's how we should do it. And when you do that, like I said, every single nutrient we need to thrive with none of the plant toxins. Interesting. Okay. So a couple questions. Who is the carnivore diet for and who is it not for? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's for, I mean, who is it not for? We're all human. Okay. We are all who we are today because we ate meat. Our ancestors mm-hmm. ate meat. I think the carnivore diet is for everyone, okay. right? The carnivore diet is not for someone who is not open-minded. The carnivore diet is not for someone who is not willing to consider organ meats in their diet. Okay. Okay. In my opinion. So I do think you can do a carnivore diet that's just steak as an elimination diet or as a temporary thing, but I think long-term that's a bad idea. Because you're going to miss the nutrients. I think you're going to get nutrient deficiencies and it's not the way that our ancestors ate animals. Cool. It's just not. So you have to do, you have to, anything we're doing, we have to do it intentionally and we have to recapitulate the, the, the ways of our ancestors. I think that's the wisest way to move through our life. Yeah. That's how we've been programmed. And so I think the carnivore diet is for everyone. I think it's for men. I think it's for women. I think it's for young. I think it's for old. It's especially for elderly. Yeah. I think it's totally safe in kids. Um, kids love meat. You were talking about your nephew and how he's yeah, just he like, loves he loves ground beef and so does my niece and yeah. kids love meat. Do we, ha- is this even surprising to us anymore that kids don't like broccoli? <laughs> That's so interesting. It's full of toxins and so is the spinach you're trying to feed them. Wow. Spinach is so high in oxalates. But try and give them a sausage or a hamburger or a steak. And if they can chew it with their small mouths, they'll be fine and they'll go crazy for it. There's so many great videos of kids online just going completely savage on a bone and you know, just eating off the bone. Like yeah. meat is the ultimate human food. And I want to clarify something for people. Meat is not harder for kids to digest. Meat is easily digestible. It does not putrefy in the gut unless you have major pancreatic dysfunction. Right. Okay. So meat is not, that is not true that meat is going to putrefy in the gut. Meat is highly absorbed. It's a very low residue diet. And if you are healthy, you can digest it just fine. Some people have problems with it because they have nutrient deficiencies, zinc, yeah. et cetera, which are generally caused by not eating meat. Right. Well, so what if someone's eating a lot of meat, but they're also eating a lot of bread and a lot of these other things. And now meat becomes the victim of, you know, when maybe now the person gets sick or something. Welcome like that. to like, epidemiology. Okay. That's yeah. epidemiology, right? Don't yeah. blame the meat for what the bread did. Right. <laughs> right. And how do you separate that out? That's the flaw with epidemiology studies. And so one of the things I would love for the listener to take away from this podcast is if someone is saying there is an association between red meat and something else, that is an epidemiology study. Look at their study. Is it interventional mm-hmm. or is it epidemiology? And epidemiology can be badly, badly confounded. Because what is the messaging that we have had as Westerners for the last 70 years? Meat is bad for you. Yeah. Fat is bad for you. Right. Saturated fat is bad for you. Right. Low fat, high carb, right? Breakfast cereal, Kellogg's, right? There's so I've got, I did a whole podcast about this on my podcast. I interviewed Gary Fetke mm-hmm. about the history of Kellogg's and how Kellogg's cereal was developed in the 1912, 1910, by Harvey Kellogg in connection with the Seventh-day Adventist to promote, car- to decrease carnal desires. To decrease, to decrease masturbation, to decrease people from actually having healthy sexual hormones and libido. So the way to become chemically castrated and decrease your libido is to eat processed breakfast cereal or basically, you know, depleted plant foods, bran, all, you know, cornflakes. Cornflakes equals impotent. You know, it's funny because vegans will always say like, oh, you know, you're going to eat a lot of meat. It's going to affect your erections, right? Cornflakes is actually the thing that's meant to (laughs) affect your erections negatively as a man and have corollary in women because in that time in history, there was a lot of concern about alcoholism and as a temperance movement. And people may have been well-intentioned, but they were very scared of their carnal desires, right? Sure. Perhaps we embrace these a little more now and we appreciate a healthy libido, but many of the original plant foods, especially Battle Creek, Michigan, Kellogg's and the cereal companies were developed in conjunction with Seventh-day Adventist principles, which are meant to quell libido. And they did that through cereals. Yeah. Okay. So it's for, you believe it's for, for everybody, everybody um, you know, 
you could be a kid later decades, obviously even more important because we become resistant to building muscle and that yeah. becomes so much more important. I mean, Gabrielle speaks about that a lot, right? Where do you get your nutrients from? Where do you get your nutrients from? You get your from? nutrients from animal foods. Right. Every one of us only has a certain amount of calories that we can eat per day. Yeah. You know, I'm a little bit bigger guy than you. I might be able to eat more calories. Right. But I want to make every single one of those calories count with the most nutrient dense food I can. Why am I wasting calories on oatmeal? Right. Right. That's completely nutrient poor. I can eat a steak and liver and fat and fat from animals is very nutrient rich. Mm -hmm. There's vitamin K2. There's vitamin E. There are fat soluble nutrients in animal fat. Mm -hmm. So if we fill the majority of our day or even half of our day with nutrient poor plant foods, we can become deficient in protein like Gabrielle talks about. We can become deficient in vitamin A, choline, all these other nutrients because we just can't fit it in. Right. And if we try and over consume calories, for many of us, that results in obesity. That's an oversimplification. Yeah. But we only have a certain bank account every day of calories to spend. That's exactly how I think of it too. And money. Man, you like, why would you, you don't waste your money. Right. You know, like, yeah. and none of us is a billionaire, a caloric billionaire. No, right. No one has an unlimited fund of calories to spend every day. No. Yeah. Right. right. There's no such thing as a caloric billionaire. Right. There are people who are slightly richer calorically. I might eat 2,700 calories a day. You might eat 2,200 calories a day. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no real, it's a very small difference. Yeah. But if you only had a certain allowance when you were a kid, you know, you only get $5 a week. Yeah. You're not going to spend $5 a week on a mop at the grocery store. <laughs> who the heck wants a mop? Like, <laughs> Oh, mom, I spent my allowance on a dustpan. What the heck, Junior? Why would you do that? Like, nobody spends their allowance on a dustpan or a mop, you know? Do you remember? Do you remember this? Because we're in the same age. Do you remember the show Supermarket Sweep? No. Oh, really? Well, they always went for the meat and the cheese. Uh-huh. Uh, or the diapers, actually, because they were the most money. And you were, anyways, whatever. Yeah. You gotta watch that show. But <laughs> nobody's, you know, like, that's like, <laughs> that's like spending your monetary bank account on yeah. crappy stuff. Like, yeah crappy toys that are going to break. Like you only have a certain allowance. Don't spend it on freaking lawn trimmings right. or fertilizer. Like spend it on a good thing. Spend it on freaking GI Joes or Barbies or whatever the heck you like. You know, as right. a kid, I'm just using them, totally. using the analogy from childhood. But that's essentially what I think is happening when people are spending their caloric bank account on plant foods. Now you can think about which plant foods might be more nutrient dense than others, which might plant foods might be more, might be less toxic. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to eliminate all plant foods. Right. Like I said, the message is that plant foods have a toxicity spectrum and we should be careful to not spend our bank account on either nutrient poor plant foods or plant foods that are low or high on the spectrum of plant toxicity. That's a stupid thing. Right. You know, you're not going to buy, nobody buys like a poisonous spider with their allowance, right? Right. Again, so this is, I'm trying to make this comparison. No, totally. But, and it's fun. And I think it is helpful to everyone listening because you can kind of paint illustrations, you know. But I think really the main takeaway is like animal, animal. 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 <laughs> it's just animal stop is going to give you the most bang for your buck like uh -huh. it's it literally needs to be the priority mm -hmm. if your goal is to live an optimally healthy i was just going to say that take <laughs> kick-ass life right so let me ask you this you gotta be then. faster on the draw you gotta get rid of those brussels sprouts <laughs> um let me ask you this. What about the person who's like, well, I don't know. I got rid of, because I hear this, you know, I, I, when I stopped eating meat, um, you know, I just felt better, which I can, I don't want to talk about it. I could, I would like to know your thoughts on that. Sure. I think it's fascinating. I think that we should study that and look mm -hmm. at it. I think it's often, that's often an unscientific statement, mm -hmm. right? You hear this a lot colloquially. What that generally means is that someone went from a standard American diet to a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, which is great because a plant-based diet is much more intentional and way better than a standard American diet. Did you also stop eating bread when you stopped eating meat? Did you also stop eating milk when you stopped eating meat? Did you also stop eating dairy or processed food or shitty breakfast cereals, right? Right. So we have to really be careful. The devil's in the details. If someone really could say to me, I was eating an organic paleo diet. Mm -hmm. And I stopped eating grass-fed, grass-finished beef, and I felt better. I would say, "Wow, that's an interesting case." I've never heard that. I've not once heard that. There are all of these sort of colloquial stories of uh, football players and basketball players who say, "I went plant-based and I feel way better," until they they have you know psychological breakdowns three months later. Kyrie Irving and many other basketball players and people like if you look at vegan athletes, they generally suck. 
and they generally crater three to four months later. It's just not sustainable for athletes. I'm just, people should look at that and not yeah. buy the propaganda from Game Changers because so many of the athletes they talk about in that movie are very poor performers. They are not at the top of their field. It's completely misleading. And that makes me super frustrated at James Wilkes and the guys who made this movie. But they will say like, hey, I was I went a plant-based and I felt better. Well, that's because you were eating Big Macs and chicken nuggets before. That's what I think. And also just to point out the athlete thing, I mean, even if let's just say for fun, right, that, you know, you're kicking ass in that period, what, what, what about your whole life? So I'm really thinking about if I can make it into 70s and 80s and 90s. It's not about like, I'm not trying to live forever. It's not that. But it's it's just about how long can I push my health span? How can I keep this, you know, this robust vitality moving through me, me into too. my later decades of life when we know that life can start working against our biology as we step into these later years, especially because of our environment that we live in now and all tell me. I want to talk about that. Please. So I did a podcast with a guy named James Clement, and he wrote a book called The Switch. He's generally plant-based, but so we disagreed on the utility of animal foods. But one of the things we did agree on was that if you look at indigenous peoples, so hunter-gatherer tribes, they have what's called compression of morbidity or squaring of the morbidity curve. And you can graph someone's functionality, right? Yeah. So on the x-axis, you do time, and on the y-axis, you do functionality, kick-ass meter, right? Yeah. So kick-ass meter is on the y-axis. And for most westernized humans, it declines gradually. It's a straight line. It just goes down. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's sort of up until you're 20 or 30, and then it just starts going down. That's not the way it looks for hunter-gatherer tribes. It's a flat line. It's called squaring of the curve. Interesting. They generally retain vitality and good health and freedom from chronic disease up until like the last two to three months of their life and then they just die quickly and go off the face of the earth, maybe even a month. So they have squaring of the mortality curve. They have squaring of morbidity. They retain vitality later in life and this is one of the main differences. The other thing that's fascinating is that if you look at indigenous hunter-gatherers, life expectancies are skewed based on higher rates of infant mortality. Mm. If someone in an indigenous tribe makes it to 50, they are as likely as us to live to 85. So they have the same life expectancy if they make it to middle adulthood, right? Interesting. They have the exact same, but they don't get chronic disease. They don't get hypertension, diabetes, cancer. Right. So they're better than us. And so oftentimes people will be misled by these ideas that they don't live as long, right? right. Well, they don't live as long because they die from um, getting trampled by elephants. They die from infections. They don't have sanitation. They have infant mortality. Most of the mortality is birth to 13 years old because they're also starving sometimes. They're hunting for animals, they don't always get right. animals. A lot of the indigenous peoples currently living on this earth are marginalized and can't hunt the big animals like they used to. Right. So this is the problem with looking at that, is that what we have now is access to food mm -hmm. and access to sanitation and access to antibiotics if we need them, though I think that's very rare. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that, yeah. terrain versus microbe. But generally what we have now is the ability to do both, but what we are plagued by is chronic disease. What's the point of living to be 80 if the last 30 years of your life are decrepit? Totally. And so many people have that. How many guys get erectile dysfunction in their 40s? Right. That is, that is that like, what the heck? That is right. crazy. You're a baby in your 40s, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. There are 75, 80-year-old guys fathering children in indigenous tribes. Right? right. And so the same thing happens with women, whether it's osteoporosis or you know, menopausal symptoms or whatever they're experiencing. Like as a Western culture in general, when we ascribe or when we live within a Western culture and eat the foods that we all have eaten, the standard American diet, yeah. we generally experience that chronic disease uh, just creep, the steady creep of chronic disease. But indigenous peoples don't get that. So super fascinating. That's a great thing to point out. That's huge right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to drop you into fiber really quick because that's a it. huge piece. I mean, I told you, you know, for me, I, I thought, and I've said this on the podcast so many times, like, because what I was taught, you know, from people who are legit, you know, we, okay, our, our microbiome needs fiber. That's how our microbiome thrives, Let's right? Talk about it. Yeah. So tell me, because right now, you know, you're thinking, animal, where are you getting the fiber? How is your microbiome going to thrive? Right? Or they yeah. go out and eat your stomach lining? Like, you know what I mean? That's like, what we're told, but it's completely wrong. So okay. Rhonda Patrick needs to show up because Rhonda Patrick <laughs> needs to stop. Dang. Rhonda Patrick <laughs> needs to stop promulgating bad information on Joe Rogan and then never showing up to actually, you know, to actually support it because she's wrong. And so the notion that we need plant fiber for a healthy microbiome is completely false. 
So my podcast is called Fundamental Health. I don't know when this podcast is going to come out, but in the next few weeks, I'm going to release an episode I did with Lucy Mayling Mm -hmm. in which she and I talked about that. Lucy's a PhD. She studies the gut very closely. She and I both agree there is no need for fiber for a, quote, healthy microbiome. The problem with that statement from the get-go is we don't actually know what a healthy microbiome is. Right, we're still learning so much about the microbiome yeah. you have when you are healthy is a healthy microbiome. Mm-hmm. Do we need fiber for an increased alpha diversity? Alpha diversity is one of the metrics that is often looked at for a quote healthy microbiome. Though it's flawed, no, we do not need fiber for an increased alpha diversity. That is false. That is false. I'm also having Chris Cresser on my podcast, and I'm going to debate him on this because there are interventional studies which show that giving someone plant fiber does not increase alpha diversity. I'm excited for this. Yeah, not yeah. increase alpha diversity. And taking fiber away does not decrease alpha diversity. There have been a, there's a week-long study with a carnivore diet mm-hmm. versus a plant-based diet. And alpha diversity did not decrease on the carnivore diet, right? Okay. So alpha diversity is a measure of the number of species in our gut, okay. right? What else do people talk about with fiber? Short-chain fatty acids. And they get hyper-focused on just one short-chain fatty acid called butyrate, Mm -hmm. which is a four-carbon short-chain fatty acid. The reason we need short-chain fatty acids is to fuel the colonic epithelial cells. So we're down in the colon. These colonic epithelial cells need short-chain fatty acids for fuel. They use it for about 70% of their metabolism. But they need short-chain fatty acids, plural. They can also use other short-chain fatty acids in addition to butyrate. Butyrate is not the only game in town. I also talk about this in the book. Well, guess what? We can make isobutyrate propionate acetate from protein and from animal collagen, which is protein. Yeah. And in the in in animal studies, we have it's been shown that we can ferment or that animals can ferment collagen into short chain fatty acids as well, and humans can do it. Yeah. So we know that butyrate signals in the gut, and isobutyrate does the exact same thing. People get hyper focused on butyrate because they don't understand the physiology well enough. Right. So we, I am making short-chain fatty acids right now on my breakfast. Like There are plenty of short-chain fatty acids in my gut. I do not have a deficiency of short-chain fatty acid. I might have slightly lower butyrate and slightly higher isobutyrate, mm-hmm. but that works just fine. It moves into the cells, yeah. and it, is, it becomes beta-hydroxybutyrate in the colonic epithelial cells. So there's also the possibility, if we are in ketosis or if we have a low-carbohydrate diet, to get beta-hydroxybutyrate from the other side. So short-chain fatty acids come through the lumen of the gut from the inside of the gut to the colonic epithelial cells. Ketones can come from the bloodstream to be fuel for the colonic epithelial cells. That is why you need short-chain fatty acids, right? The mucus layer is completely a myth. Really? Right, yes. Not that the mucus layer is a myth, but the the fact that you need fiber for a mucus layer is completely a myth. What we know from studies of a carnivore diet on the microbiome is that the microbiome shifts when we do a carnivore diet. And it shifts to a microbiome that may not be as dependent on mucus or carbohydrates. Yeah. And what we also know is that there is an organism called Ackermansia mucinophilia. And Ackermansia lives on the mucus layer, right? Ackermansia increases during fasting. Okay. Okay. So how could an organism, that's zero, fi, would you agree that fasting is a zero fiber diet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. So how can an organism that lives on the mucus layer of the gut increase on a zero fiber diet that fasting, there's more to this equation, Yeah. right? So acromancia increases during fasting. There's plenty of mucus in my gut, right? If there weren't mucus in my gut, everybody on a carnivore diet would be getting inflammatory bowel disease. And we actually see the reverse. Many people on carnivore diets resolve gas, bloating, constipation, Mm -hmm. painful symptoms, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. These are commonly resolved on carnivore diets. So And no one has demonstrated that a lack of fiber leads to inflammation in the gut. It's all conjecture, and it's generally based on one mouse study from 2016 published in the journal Cell, which was done, which was contrived. I won't go into the details to bore people, but Rhonda Patrick is saying that based on one study in mice, which is contrived and uses a false model for the microbiome in the mice. I can go into it if you want. Basically, they took... I can't, reg- I can't, I can't, you know, I can't prevent You're it. You're such a beast. No, I mean. So basically what they do is they raise mice that are notobiotic. It's G-N-O-T-O, right? Notobiotic. They raise mice with no bacteria in their gut. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is how they do these studies. So the mice have no microbiome. And they take one group of mice and they put in a, quote, human-like microbiome with 11 species of bacteria in this cell study. Mm-hmm. 11 species of bacteria that are all fiber-loving. 
oh, that's interesting, because there's fiber-liking bacteria and there's protein-liking bacteria in our gut, right? And as I said, we can shift between them based on our diet, as we would have evolutionarily. I was just going there, because, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and so, but they did, this is a contrived study. They gave the mice a human-like microbiome, quote, mm-hmm. which was all fiber-loving bacteria. It was only 11 species. Mm-hmm. Do you know how many species are in your gut? Over 1,000, right. right? This is a contrived model. And then they took that fiber-loving microbiome from those mice and deprived it of fiber. And they say, oh, the mucus layer got a little thinner. But when they looked at histologically, there was no evidence for inflammation in the gut, and there was no evidence for any histopathologic changes in the two groups. So this is the study that's been repeated by Gundry and Rhonda Patrick and many others, and it actually doesn't have any legitimate findings, and it's completely contrived. Wow. If you that's put, a big deal. Yeah, what happens to the mucus layer of the gut if you put in... A, a carnivore microbiome or a real microbiome that can yeah. shift, right? Right. They took, a, they took a fake microbiome, 11 species microbiome. That's, you know, one one hundredth the size of my microbiome. And they put only fiber-liking bacteria. It's going to shift gradually, yeah. but they didn't give enough time. And so what we see in people who do a carnivore diet is that the microbiome shifts and you do more protein-producing organisms. And that's fine. That's what we would have always done. If you look at the reason people think we need fiber for a diverse microbiome is because we look at indigenous hunter-gatherers right? And they have a lot of diversity. Their diversity dwarfs ours. Totally. But is it the fact that they eat more fiber, which they don't always do, but they might because the Inuit have a pretty diverse microbiome and they don't have a lot of fiber in their diet. We can look at Norwegian or higher latitude hunter-gatherers. They still have a diverse microbiome. They don't have any fiber. Right. But people generalize and say hunter-gatherers have fiber, therefore, and that's why they have a diverse microbiome. That's again, an oversimplification. Yeah. But I can see that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but the, what else do they do that gives them a diverse microbiome? They right. kill animals. Yeah. They touch deer. They touch antelope. I'll tell you, when I went hunting and got a deer with my bow, like I'm touching the deer. We know that t- petting a dog can change your microbiome. Right. Right? So what about petting a deer or gutting a deer respectfully or having your hands in an animal and all these bacteria that are teeming around an animal? Right. Just being in the woods and camping, getting dirty, swimming in the ocean can change your microbiome. Yeah. Well, even, you know, for, for um, I've learned that, you know, for what's best for your baby, pregnancy, like a natural birth, right? Natural birth. Exactly. Thank you. Um, because of that reason too, right? It's all connected. Right. right. And right. people are starting to do this now um, where they will do a vaginal swab on the baby if they right. do C-section because they want to seed the microbiome yeah. with everything from the birth canal as we should. But yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that to get a diverse microbiome, we should cover ourselves in like... <laughs> poop or vaginal secretions. But I mean, there are therapies out there, fecal microbiota transplant that have been used, but diversity in the microbiome is not related to fiber. That's, yeah, that's not related to fiber. It's related to, it's it's related to other things that we do in our lives, generally speaking, or it could be related to other things in general, but it's not exclusive to fiber. So I'll just wrap on the fiber stuff a little bit more for people know, and then we can talk about polyphenols because people are probably thinking that I'm crazy for thinking they're not good for humans. (laughs) Um, but you know, the uh, the other things with fiber are constipation, which is false. If you actually look at the medical literature, mm-hmm. fiber can increase the size of your bowel movements, mm-hmm. but it doesn't improve pain, use of laxatives, or bleeding. So when people have constipation, they generally have pain with passage, use of laxatives, bleeding, straining with stool. Yep. Fiber will give you more bigger painful stools, but it won't improve any of the other symptoms of constipation. It doesn't improve constipation. There's actually an interventional trial that I talk about in the book in which the removal, the complete removal of fiber resulted in 100% resolution of constipation in a group of 20 people. So it was 60 people, one group stayed the same amount of fiber, one group produced fiber, one group completely eliminated fiber. They all had idiopathic constipation. Mm -hmm. All 20 in the zero fiber group resolved idiopathic constipation. So fiber and constipation is a fallacy. Fiber and diverticulosis, complete fallacy. There are studies that show, they're epidemiology studies, but they show that via colonoscopy Mm -hmm. studies, the more fiber someone eats, the more diverticulosis they get. Interesting. It's not causal. It's only correlative because it's epidemiology, but that certainly doesn't support a role for fiber in preventing diverticulosis. Yeah. Fiber and cancer failed miserably. Both cereal supplements and increased fruits and vegetables did not prevent recurrence of colonic adenoma in five and six year follow-up studies. In 1999, 2000, 2001, there was a series of studies published in the New England Journal. So fiber and cancer, no, fiber doesn't prevent colon cancer. So these are all the things we've been told. Right. They're all false. Well, I think about fasting, like when people do long periods of water. I, I, I don't typically hear, I'm just thinking about this now, constipation and fasting. <laughs> right. Right? Like I just, just Sometimes you get the like, reverse. 
Yeah, sure. Some people will yeah. fast and they actually get diarrhea because things are resetting in the right. gut or gut flora changes and stuff. Right. Yeah, That's I mean, interesting. yeah, people, I mean, sometimes when people are fasting, they don't have a whole lot of poop to move out. Totally. There's always some little bit of poop. But right. Yeah. It, but that's true. I mean, fasting is a zero fiber diet. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah. And the other piece of the equation, that's pretty much the whole story with fiber. We can go into polyphenols if you want. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. So this is the part of the plant toxins that I think is generally most difficult for people to get their head around. Yeah. So I did a talk recently in Arizona and I had a slide and the slide said, these are all of the polyphenolic molecules made by the human body. And it was just like this. It was just a blank slide. There are no polyphenols made by human biochemistry. Polyphenols are only made by plants. So one of the themes that I talk about in the book is different operating systems. There's a human biochemistry operating system, and then there are plant and fungi and bacterial operating systems. Mm -hmm. And plant biochemistry doesn't really work well with human biochemistry. Polyphenols are uniquely plant-based molecules. Mm -hmm. We've been told they're so good for us. We've been told they're antioxidants. This is not even debatable. Any scientist worth their salt will admit they are pro-oxidants, not antioxidants. And we talked about this. This goes into hormesis, and I'll tell you why I think that concept is misled, misguided. But plant molecules are generally pro-oxidants. Oxidation and reduction are the gain and loss of electrons. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Gain of electrons is reduction. So what we're talking about is movement of electrons. Mm -hmm. Something that is an antioxidant endogenously, like a molecule of glutathione, so naturally occurs in our bodies, takes a free radical, which is a molecule with an unpaired electron, and gives it a paired electron. So an antioxidant donates an electron, right? It reduces a free radical. It donates an electron. An unpaired electron is irascible. An unpaired, an unpaired electron is a misbehaving child, yeah, right? right. And basically, an antioxidant takes a misbehaving child and gives it a chill pill, not mm -hmm. an actual pill because you shouldn't medicate kids. But it gives <laughs> that kid a timeout or it gives that kid some soothing music and just calms that kid the heck down. Gives that kid a freaking nap, Yeah, right? <laughs> like lovingly gives that kid a nap. Like yeah. an antioxidant just chills out the irascible child of a free radical, right? Mm -hmm. Plant molecules create free radicals. They do not do the opposite. So interesting. Right? Yeah. Plant molecules also do not participate directly in human biochemistry, meaning they do not do this action of donating electrons to other molecules and acting as antioxidants. We have our own antioxidants. Yeah. Glutathione does that. But everyone believes on your Baruch nuts, it says full of antioxidants. Right. That's not true. <laughs> That's false advertising. It like, should say, I love my baruchinus. It should say full of prooxidants, full of polyphenols, which are prooxidants. Now, the reason we think of these molecules as antioxidants is because they induce a system in the liver called the NRF2 system. Yes. NRF2, right? NRF2 is part of an antioxidant response system. It activates a series of genes that upregulates our own antioxidant response. Right. Right? But as I mentioned to you earlier today, there are many things that we would consider to be toxic that also upregulate NRF2. Go for it. Cigarette smoke, <laughs> lead, alcohol, right? They're all pro-oxidants. They're all the same type of thing. So here's what I think. All of those can be, quote, hormetics, but these are, there are environmental hormetics and there are molecular hormetics. Okay. Molecular hormesis, molecules that trigger antioxidant responses by trigger NRF2, mm -hmm. include polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are formed when you cook meat, cigarette smoke, alcohol, you know, all these things, and sulforaphane. Right. And sulforaphane is an isothiocyanate, but um, other polyphenols, resveratrol, et cetera, okay? Yeah. They all activate NRF2. Why do we say that some are good and some are bad? It's false. You know, we either have to say they're all bad or they're all good. And I think that at the level of the NRF2 system, they can all be hormetic. Yeah. And so what I'm saying here is that absent, and this is a super controversial statement, absent of all the chemicals, 400 chemicals that are sprayed on tobacco, yeah. a little bit of tobacco smoke is probably a hormetic thing for humans, yeah. right? Some of the longest lived people in the world smoke tobacco every day, but it's natural tobacco. Well, maybe that's why, because all the other shit that comes with a cigarette oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and the, yeah. Oh, yeah and i'm not advocating for tobacco but we're no, all no, exposed no, to fires at all. Yeah. you know we're all exposed to fires campfires and everything yeah. and there's similar chemicals right and we get exposed to that in meat they're all a little bit of those things can be good for us right and yeah. that's okay that's what everybody banks on when they say sulforaphane right, right 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 it's gonna turn on your glutathione right the two problems i have with this are do does that sulforaphane is does it give us anything extra 
And the other piece of this is, what about all the other things sulforaphane does in the human body that we're never told about? And that is the most important piece to emphasize to people that I will elaborate on right now. Yeah. So sulforaphane does not just come into our body, as an example, right? Mm -hmm. It's an isothiocyanate. It's made in broccoli and other brassica vegetables. Mm -hmm. It's clearly a plant defense molecule. And all the pharmaceuticals that we use, or if you go to the pharmacy and you get a pharmaceutical from the pharmacist, mm -hmm. they're going to give you a package insert. Whatever drug it is, it has side effects. Right. When you take broccoli sprouts, you don't get a side effect list for sulforaphane, but that is still a plant molecule. That is still a pharmaceutical. Yeah. Right? If someone patented that molecule and made it into a drug, they would have to give you a list of side effects. And you would be amazed at the list of side effects of that plant molecule because not only does it upregulate your antioxidant system, it also circulates in your body and oxidizes membranes. It also impairs the absorption of iodine at the level of the thyroid and causes thyroid, uh, thyroid problems. Wow. These are the collateral effects. This is the package insert. These are the side effects of plant molecules that everyone is ignoring. Why do we assume that plants are good for us? This is the narrative. We need to change the narrative or at least accept that there's an alternative narrative, that plants are defending themselves. Plants have toxins. And these toxins might not be as good for us as we believe they are. And I think that most of the time, the toxins are a clear net negative. And that goes back to the first premise, which is show me how sulforaphane makes us better. It doesn't. Because we can be optimal from an antioxidant perspective. I can get plenty of glutathione with environmental hormesis. Not molecular hormesis. We yeah. talked about this too. Jumping in the sauna. Jumping in the cold sauna. Pond, cold plunge. Yeah. Exercise. Sunlight. Ketosis. Yeah. Fasting. Interesting. These trigger the same thing. That also triggers NRF too. Yeah. But sunlight doesn't really have side effects, right? right. I mean, somebody could well, say, oh, it's going to cause cancer. cancer, right? That's a little nuanced thing, right? Okay. Like if, if you get too many DNA breaks, you can get cancer from sunlight. But generally speaking, that has to do with terrain. And people are sick and they're not repairing the brakes well. But exercise, you know, like exercise doesn't have a lot of side effects, right? Exercise isn't circulating. What I'm saying is these are environmental hormetics. They're outside of us. They're not circulating in our body. Right. Right. If you eat too much sulforaphane, you can definitely get too many DNA breaks as well. Because sulforaphane can also cause DNA breaks. That's one of the ways that it, that it triggers the NRF2 system is by causing DNA breaks. So they're, they don't trigger that the mechanism by which sunlight can cause DNA breaks is the mechanism by which it activates NRF2, right? You just don't want to overexpose yourself. Yeah. We talked about the fact that it's very valuable. And on the way over here, we were talking about how ultraviolet light is uniquely valuable, way beyond vitamin D, and that we should not just be supplementing with vitamin D. We need ultraviolet light. Right. To really that. And I, I said something that I thought was interesting that I should repeat on the podcast. Vitamin D is processed sunlight. It's processed food. If you want whole food, you have to get real sunlight. It's only, sunlight is much more than vitamin D. That's an aside. But so back to the molecular hormetic thing and the environmental hormetic thing, sauna, not a lot of side effects, right? It's going to induce NRF2 and your body is going to upregulate the amount of glutathione, but there's not gonna be a molecule circulating in your body that affects DNA and other enzymes badly. Mm -hmm. That is what happens with plant molecules. You don't need plants to be optimal. Polyphenols do not provide optimal benefit for humans. There's a series of studies I talk about in the book that illustrates this very well. Okay. And there's five or six of these. I'll give a summary of all of them. Generally, they're between four and 12 weeks in length. Mm -hmm. And they take two groups of people a mix of men and women. Most of the studies are between 20 and 60 people. And they do the experiment. They say, we're going to give one group no vegetables and fruits. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give the other group a pound plus of fruits and vegetables a day. And they're going to look at all the markers you'd want to see. HS, CRP, inflammatory markers, oxidative stress damage markers, 8-hydroxy, 2-deoxyguanosine, DNA damage markers, markers uh, malandialdehyde, thiobarbituric acid substances, right? They're going to look at all the markers of oxidative stress, mm -hmm. DNA damage, and inflammation. Okay. And most people listening to this podcast would say, of course, a pound of fruits and vegetables per day, it's going to improve all of them. Right. Doesn't change a thing. Yeah. The same. And there's one study in which the removal of fruits and vegetables led to better markers. Wow. Better markers. So where is the benefit. Where are the benefits of fruits and vegetables if we can't demonstrate it in interventional trials? It's an empty promise. It's an empty promise. You don't need fruits and vegetables to be optimal from an inflammatory standpoint, from an antioxidant standpoint, from an uh, oxidative stress standpoint, from a DNA damage standpoint. Yeah. You just lead what I call a radical life. Yeah. You do what we did today. You exercise, you go in a sauna, you jump in a cold water, right? Yeah. That's, you go in the sun. Yeah. Your glutathione will be optimal. Fruits and vegetables provide no benefit beyond that. It's not been clearly demonstrated. There are tons of conflicting studies here, right? So yeah. why would you risk 
plant molecules harming you if there's no benefit. This is the problem with polyphenols. This is the problem with sulforaphane and isothiocyanates. Rhonda Patrick can't demonstrate clearly that sulforaphane is, gives you anything you can't get otherwise. But if you focus in and do a really myopic study in the short term, you can say, hey, sulforaphane inc increased glutathione. That decreased DNA damage. Yeah, so what? What about all the iodine it inhibited the thyroid? What about all the negative effects it had on the thyroid? You're not telling me about that. And I don't need sulforaphane to have optimal glutathione. Right. Because if I'm eating a healthy lifestyle, and these studies were not carnivore diet, right? Mm -hmm. The no fruits and vegetable group were probably eating things like bread, oh. you know, crappy foods. Yeah. You would see it, I think it would be even more pronounced if they were eating a carnivore diet. I would love to see carnivore diet versus, you know, fruits and vegetables plus meat. Yeah. You know, and look at the end and we'll see the markers. Right. And there's tons of studies like that. There's another study they did in Denmark where they increased the amount of fruit and vegetable people were eating from three servings a week to more than a pound and a half a day. Mm -hmm. And they gave them 300 milliliters of fruit juice per day. And they were able to show that the vitamin C intake went from 70 to 270 per day milligrams. And the vitamin C levels increased. But again, with an increase in fruits and vegetables and an increase in serum levels of vitamin C, no change in oxidative stress or inflammatory markers in these people. So where are the benefits of fruits and vegetables? Where are they? It's so gnarly. To it's so, so gnarly. So many people are like, whoa. They probably don't believe it. Again, they're getting they're getting cognitive dissonance and they're getting and the condition is kicking in really well, and freaking it, hard right now. It's a good place to to go, I think, because I I'm, I agree. And because I'm sitting here and my mind is blown too. And like I said, you know, I'm not necessarily ready to even taking in all this knowledge with so much respect. Um not necessarily ready to drop my Brussels sprouts. So to kind of point what I'm saying out is that this food is just so fucking emotional. <laughs> it's emotional, you know, and you don't have much time left. I, I got it. I want to respect that. But I kind of want to just maybe touch that a little bit with you if we can. Just this idea of that it is emotional. Like, what was I saying? Um, it's my pleasure. Like my avocado is my pleasure, right? My, br my Brussels sprouts. Right. Yeah. And so... There's a lot of conditioning tied up in that, right? I want to respect that for people. And in the book, I give a carnivore-ish diet, which includes some plant foods. And I say, if you want to eat plants for color, variety, or entertainment, you can. But I'm really not convinced that there's a good amount of scientific evidence to say that that's doing anything better for you. And I would be curious how you would feel without them, you know? Yeah. And then let's just call a spade a spade. Using food as entertainment is a great way to go down a route. It's a slippery slope. You know what else is pleasurable? A pop tart. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, totally. Butter popcorn, Swizzlers. Like, I mean, food is comfort for a lot of people. Right. And that means they have a psychological issue that is unaddressed. Or something that's just not being fulfilled in their life. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. How much yeah. people how many people are emotionally eating? And they're going to rebel against me because if I recommend taking that stuff away, they're gonna feel like I'm stripping them of their their comfort. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna do that. I wanna be compassionate, I wanna be kind to people who are suffering but address it at the root cause. Right. Don't use food as a drug either. Yeah. And this is not to say that a steak is not been, is not enjoyable. Oh no, it's so right? good, man. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, we were talking about this. Like, I, I'm not force feeding myself steak. I enjoy the organ meats. Yeah. I love bone broth. Like, totally. I, I love these foods. I love, I love rich animal foods. And so I'm just, I've just kind of re- calibrated right i don't miss an avocado right right, right. i don't miss cookies Wait, i don't want bread i don't want the french exactly. fry like truly i don't want the cookie but you think you'll miss brussels sprouts and you totally. think you'll miss an avocado now an avocado is one of the things i think of as less toxic brussels sprouts i think of as more toxic because it's a brassica vegetable yeah it has that plant defense system that's going to lead to isothiocyanates including sulforaphane mm -hmm. it's clearly a plant booby trap system right? <laughs> it is absolutely plant booby traps right booty traps yeah <laughs> Goonies, booty traps. Yeah, totally. Of course I went there. Mm -hmm. 80s forever. Yeah. Such an 80s baby. Booty traps. Um, so, but, you know, like there is a lot of conditioning and I want to be sensitive to that. I'm not telling people to get rid of all the plants. Yeah. I'm saying there's a spectrum of plant toxicity. There are thousands of people thriving now with zero plants. Yeah. And they eat an avocado occasionally. They don't die. Yeah. But better, you know, best to better. Best how to go better. How good could you be? Yeah. I don't know. And I love that question. It's literally something that baits me every single day. And I do want to say too, and I, I, I said this um, earlier about my chocolate hue kitchen cashews. Like I understand that when I, I don't eat them every day, but when I do, I know I want them for the dopamine hit. I know. Cause I look at, it's like, Oh, I want the hormone. I, I want the pleasure, which the pleasure is that dopamine hit. That's right. Just it tastes good, but the horm it's, 
the effect that's happening to my body biologically from this food, I'm also very aware of, you know, why I'm eating this food. Is I think we need to be say. very careful okay. using food as reward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe in cheat days. I think neither do I. Like, don't use food as reward. Don't use food as nourishment and Mm -hmm. learn to enjoy the simple parts of food. Food should not be reward. If we're rewarding ourselves with food, what is the unmet need of our psyche? So Carl Jung said that all suffering or is unmet tasks. How many unmet tasks do we have? If someone is not actualized, like where is the unmet unmet task in someone's psyche if they are using food that way? And I want to be sensitive to that. Yeah. And I want to realize that that is real for people. But look, if your conditioning is kicking in, if you're just like, I am never getting rid of my bagels, like where is your unmet task? You know, and- Look, we're all in this life. We've all got to survive. Yeah. There are way worse things than bagels. There are way worse things than avocados and baruca nuts and hue chocolate, you know, things like heroin or yeah. you know, hard drugs that destroy lives. But, you know, generally what I'm thinking for a lot of people is, look, the people that I want to hear this are the people who are suffering with autoimmune disease, inflammation, dermatologic disease, eczema, psoriasis, depression, anxiety, which are inflammatory in your brain a lot of the times who are not finding relief with plant-based diets, who are not finding relief with paleo diets, who are still suffering and they feel there is no hope. There's a very viable strategy and it's very ancestrally consistent and it's eliminating all plants for at least some of the time. Listen, one of my very good friends has severe microbiome issues. This just hit me. And she is so sensitive to foods. Like her diet has to be so specific and it's it's, I guess, I guess it would be fair to say that it's carnivore-ish, like if almost not totally carnivore, like just from witnessing what she shares and just going out to eating with her, um, she can't have the plant. It'll fuck her up. There are tons of people like, like that. Like put her in bed. Yeah. There are tons yeah. of people like that. There's lots of in- stories of people like that. I mean, Michaela Peterson is that way. And yeah. I mean, some people are more sensitive than others. Right. Right. right? And look, you're kicking a lot of butt. Like, can I really make, can I really make a case that you need to get rid of your Brussels sprouts? Not really, you know, but look, I think you'd feel better without them. It's worth an experiment in my opinion, but you're already mostly carnivore-ish. Yeah. You know, you're already mostly there. Like for people that are meeting, not getting enough meat, like there's a spectrum, right? Right. And I do think it's reasonable to go all the way. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, it's, it's mostly for people who are suffering and realizing there's nothing else left. Well, there's a very viable, very ancestrally consistent way of eating that's left. That's totally safe, supported by science in the book, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I want to make sure we talk about farming and regenerative No, I was just going, why are you trying to beat me? Listen. Oh my God. Okay. Whose podcast is this? <laughs> Welcome to the Fundamental no. Health Podcast. <laughs> I want to get you a steak before you have to get on with your day. Thanks for coming on my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a great guest, actually. No, but I, I because I hear this often. You know, it's not even about what, you know, animal products are doing to me. It's what it's doing to the earth. Sure. So let's go there. Oh, my God. I am so passionate about this. I am so on fire about this. Like, you know what? That sentiment, I respect that sentiment because, you know, we should really think about what we're doing to the earth. There's a very Native American ancestral concept that we are not, we did not weave the web of life. We are a strand on the web of life. So I love that people are thinking about that. Unfortunately, most people thinking that way live in LA and have never been camping in their life and they have no idea what the earth is about, right? I'm just calling, no, it's, you know, I, just, I, I I'm just calling a spade you. a spade. I'm just calling yeah. it like it is. There probably are a lot of people who do say that who are environmental champions and have been out there. But so here's the deal. Why are we told that animals are not good for the earth? Generally, it's because of greenhouse gases. Okay, let's unpack that. Yes. Okay, let's unpack that. So in the book, I have a couple of graphics that'll be very helpful for people. When people are told that ruminant animals, specifically cows, contribute significantly to greenhouse gases, they are being told this based on FAO data Mm -hmm. from 2016. So FAO data, right? And if you look at the FAO data, it's all livestock. So it's not just cows. It's life cycle, meaning it's not just what comes out of cows. It's what the amount of carbon that's used to move cows around. It's the amount of fuel that's, you know, it's basically all the carbon in the whole life cycle to bring a cow. Sure. The amount of carbon that's, you know, used to ship the cow to the grocery right. store. Right. That's a life cycle, all animals. Okay. Yep. Globally. Right. Mm-hmm. And it is percentage of anthropogenic carbon emissions. Right. So if we are looking at greenhouse gases, what percentage are non-anthropogenic? like 85%. 
85% of the greenhouse gas that goes into the environment has always been going into the environment. It's part of the carbon cycle. We'll mm -hmm. talk about that. Human emissions are 15%. So FAO data is percentage of anthropogenic emissions, mm -hmm. livestock, global, okay. right? And it's life cycle. It's compared to tailpipe emissions for transportation. That's not life cycle. They're comparing apples to oranges. No one has ever done a life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas emissions on transportation. Does not exist. If you are comparing tailpipe to tailpipe, quote, <clears throat> and we compare the amount of methane that a cow produces mm -hmm. to the amount of carbon dioxide that a car produces, it's not even similar. In the United States now, mm -hmm. we can look at all livestock or ruminants. Ruminants specifically, meaning cows, cows, 1.9, this is EPA data, this is not debatable, 1.9% of greenhouse gases are come out of the cow, okay? Yep. 30% come out of the tailpipe of a car. Well, That's yeah. apples to apples. Yeah. That's tailpipe to tailpipe, right? Yeah. And it's not cow farts, it's mostly cow burps. Yeah. And the methane coming out of a cow is completely different than the carbon dioxide coming out of a car. And I'll tell you why. Carbon dioxide coming out of a car is new carbon in the environment. Mm -hmm. The methane coming out of a cow participates in a carbon cycle, moves into the atmosphere, becomes carbon dioxide, is fixed back into carbohydrate in a plant. The root system of the plant fixes it. It's eaten by a cow and it goes back up. It's the same carbon atom. There have always been this number of carbon atoms. The new carbon on this planet is from electricity generation, coal burning, transportation, right? right? We can see the amount of carbon in the environment increasing from 280 to 415 ppm. That's tailpipe. That's transportation. That's electricity generation. That is technology. Mm -hmm. The carbon, the 280 ppm has always been there. That's the carbon cycle from a cow, right? Yeah. And the majority of that carbon cycle is actually from the ocean. Oh, really? Right. And so where does the majority of methane come from? Termites. No way. Greta Thunberg is not campaigning against termites. Termites wow. produce more methane than cows. It's part of the carbon cycle. It's always been there. You know what else produces methane? What? Large bogs in Africa. Large natural wetlands that produce, right? Are we, are we saying pave the wetlands? <laughs> you know, this is absurd. Methane is not the molecule that we should be worried about. It's carbon dioxide. Wow. Methane participates in a carbon cycle. It's always been there. Yeah. You know what else releases carbon dioxide into the environment? Tilling of the earth. Okay. Huge producer. No plant-based advocate or anyone that thinks or vilifies ruminants is worried about the tilling of the soil. The majority of carbon is stored in the soil. And wow. I want to talk about this because there are ways to increase the amount of carbon in the soil. Yeah. How do you release carbon in the soil? You cut the soil. You cut the soil with a tilling machine and then you grow crops in it. So... Anyone who is saying that cows are contributing to climate change or that cows are big producers of greenhouse gases should be challenged with how much the plants they are eating are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at EPA data, mm -hmm. plant agriculture actually contributes more greenhouse gas than all livestock expo ex agriculture in the United States. So what are they proposing? That we eliminate all cows and double plant agriculture? That's not going to change greenhouse gas emissions at all from cows. Or right. that's not going to change greenhouse gas emissions at all. Yeah. Right? And the tilling of the soil is going to release more carbon dioxide with no one is really actually quantifying. So let's talk about the soil a little bit. Yeah. This is, this is really my heart and soul right now. I'm so interested in regenerative agriculture, which is raising animals and plants in a biodynamic fashion, which is no till. Mm -hmm. But if we raise animals on the land, grass feeding, grass finishing, rotational grazing of animals... What farms like White Oak Pastures and Belcampo in California have shown is that we can increase the amount of carbon in the soil and increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. There, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, there is no more important metric, in my opinion, than the amount of organic matter in the soil to the persistence of the human race. Our soil has been depleted of organic matter so badly because of monocrop agriculture yeah. and tilling of the soil right? If you don't have organic matter in the soil, you can't grow anything in the soil. Think desert. Think Black Rock City for all you burners out there. <laughs> Nothing grows in Black Rock City. You can't graze cattle there. You can't grow food there. There's no organic matter in that soil. Think about the heartland of the United States. There used to be 200 million ruminants, including over 100 million buffalo. 
moving on that land, stomping, churning the land, pooping on the land, dying on the land and getting reabsorbed into the land. That land was part of the most fertile part of the, of the US until we monocropped the hell out of it. Yeah. And now it's gone. Every generation of plants pulls organic matter, pulls nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium out of the soil. And we don't replenish it because we don't have animals on the soil. Ecosystems need animals and plants. Animals eat grass, animals pee, they poop, they return nutrients to the ground. Anyone who gardens knows you have to put poop in the soil, whether it's human poop, totally. like in indigenous peoples did, worm castings or, or horse manure. Why do they put horse manure on landscaping? Yeah, totally. Because they want it to grow. Right. Right? That is how you make soil rich, but we are forgetting that. And so what's incredible about regenerative agriculture is they can do a life cycle analysis mm -hmm. and they can show that regenerative agriculture fixes more carbon into the soil than it produces, right? So you're carbon negative. Wow. You're carbon negative. You can raise animals and be carbon negative. And it increases the amount of organic matter in the soil. That's so rad. Which leads to healthier plants, healthier animals, and... When there's more organic matter in the soil, you can grow more plants on a given plot of soil, which means you can expand the number of animals that are there. Right. People always say you can't scale grass-fed agriculture. Bullshit. You can absolutely scale grass-fed, grass-feeding of animals. There is enough land in the United States. We could today, if we changed over to regenerative agriculture everywhere, mm -hmm. and we were able to increase the productivity of the land by 30% by increasing the organic matter in the soil, yeah. we could wipe out feedlots in the United States and every single cattle, every single cow in the United States could be grass-fed, grass-finished. There's enough land to do that if we take away all the feedlot operations. Wow. Right? That's so amazing. it's totally doable, but only if we do it right. Right. We have to rotationally graze the cow, meaning they graze on one paddock, then they move to another paddock, then they move to another paddock. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing an event at White Oak Pastures in May. Everyone is welcome to come to it. We did it last year. It's called White Oak Cella oh. <laughs> after Coachella, right? You can cool. see White Oak Pastures. You can see their 3,000 acre farm. You can see the soil. It's brown. It's brown. It's 5% organic matter. And then 35 feet away on his neighbor's property, it's 0.5% organic matter. 20 years of regenerative farming completely increased the amount of organic matter in that soil. And 5% is a lot. For every 1% of organic matter increase in the soil, the soil can hold 25,000 liters or gallons of water per hectare. Meaning when there's rain, it stays in the ground. That's incredible. And doesn't run off. And that has to do with the amount of organic matter in the soil. Yeah. The fungal networks, the mycorrhizal networks, the plant networks. How do they get there? Animals. Animals pooping on the ground, animals that eating the grass. so much sense. I, of course, that's the way it always was. <laughs> it's, like, it's not even that, uh, it's, I don't want to say it's not profound. I'm just saying like, this is very simple to understand. You remove animals from the earth, the ecosystem will collapse. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and they're not even really contributing to greenhouse gas changes. Right. They're part of a carbon cycle. Yeah. People need to eat something. Right. Absolutely. You increase plant-based agriculture, that's going to increase their carbon. Yeah. Right? So- wow. The, the the problem is not ruminants. Yeah. I mean, I retweeted something from Elon Musk where he said this. Like, I saw that. Ve everyone going vegan will not solve climate change. I saw that and I'm like, dang, that's, you know, especially will, coming from him. It will not know? solve climate change. It won't do shit for climate change. It'll yeah. create mass nutritional deficiencies and ecosystems collapse because then you will really be screwed because you will not be able to grow anything on the soil. Right. And at that point, I will pack my bags and my bow and arrow and I will go live in the woods in a loincloth. <laughs> And hunt my own animals because we'll That's all be so screwed, right? And I will not eat prickly pear cactus <laughs> unless I am starving <laughs> because there's nothing else to do, right? I have that, a feeling you would not be starving. I think you'll be all right. It depends. I mean, there's not a lot of animals left, right? I'd have yeah. to go to like Montana or follow the animals around or who knows where I would go. But I mean, that there would be nothing to grow because we will deplete the soil so much. If we remove ruminants, there will be nothing to grow. The reason we can keep growing crops is because of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And that's not, that's a fake, that's like just processed food. Right. It's processed food. And then we're tilling the soil. The topsoil is destroyed. I encourage people, go in the woods, go into the wilderness, look for how much is edible there. Mm -hmm. Look for how much won't kill you. Yeah. And then go to farms. See where your food is being grown. And realize that there are amazing farms like Belcampo here in Northern California. They have mm -hmm. restaurants in LA. They're awesome people. They're doing regenerative agriculture. That, that steak last night was incredible. Yep. Yeah, so good. Yep, so good. So that's a huge piece. And, and you you break this down in your book. Mm -hmm. That's I huge. break it all down. In the I book. know, it's so good. I feel so special that I got a little teaser of it. So again, okay, listen, 
we got to feed you. You got to get out. You have things to do. Um, I want to ask you a fun question. If you had a magic wand, I feel like this is such a no brainer, but if you had a magic wand and you can basically add some kind of positive lifestyle change, um, to everyone with this magic wand, what would it be? You could go anywhere. It could not be diet. It could be. So I've got another doctor friend and we joke about having this like regenerative ranch. Mm -hmm. So I think my dream is to have a regenerative ranch, like to have a farm of my own. I don't want to be a, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm yeah. an explorer. And now I want to be an explorer who's a farmer. So I would just, I would give everybody a wilderness experience. You know, I would wave the magic wand and everybody is like, has a backpack on and is in the woods and has somebody to like shepherd them around. But I want everyone to see what it's like, how the way that our ancestors lived, mm -hmm. right? I would do a time machine and everybody would get a week 30,000 years ago with their tribe, with their ancestors' tribe. They'd, they'd feel comfortable with them. They wouldn't feel like a fish out of the water, but they would remember. The magic wand would be a, a, a sort of a waving of remembrance. Like remember where you've come from. Remember what it was like to live this way and then bring that context back to your life today and don't forget it because I think it's that forgetting that has been replaced by contextualization or by conditioning, and that is really harming us. So it's a wand of remembering, like go remember where you've come from, the wilderness, the way that animals were, the way that we interacted with the land. Okay. That's what people have forgotten, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, <clears throat> there's so much reverence when you are connected to that, you know, and you're you're more mindful, I think, you're more intentional, you're more present when you have that kind of connection to, to what you just said, I love that. Yeah, I think that that was a big part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. Well, one thing I want to point out before I let you go um, is this. You know, I <laughs> I always say like food really affects your mood, you know, and it really shapes your I, – I, it's to me, I think we, we so agree on this. It's like the biggest piece to our health and not just our health, but just I feel like what we embody, our essence. I really do feel like it's the biggest play on that, right? Absolutely. Um, and what I have noticed about you from – it's spending time with you watching your podcast and all that is, um, you know, you're really empathetic. You're compassionate, you're warm, you're generous. I mean, you're very passionate about, and, and but the passion is coming from such a beautiful place of like, you want people to feel good and to be kicking ass, you know, but the thought of such a, you know, a diet so focused on animal, I, I wondered, before you, like, how does this play on the person's personality and character? Like, are they more aggressive and like, and it's so interesting. I'm just, I want to say it publicly. It's been so rad to just silently just kind of witness like how you, and it's so consistent on every podcast that you've been a guest on how in real life. I'm like, wow, you know, you, you're really warm and compassionate and, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I felt like it was something that I wanted to share. It's it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Because I think too, like you can think like people who just eat plants and this is no hit on anyone. Like, oh, you're the compassionate one and you're the empathetic and you're, um, yeah, I, you are an example that that's actually not the truth. So. And I think there are kind people and on both sides but me too right. yeah, I, yeah i'm not trying to point yeah, out yeah, that exactly. no, but i'm just saying yeah. that it's not just that and it's yeah. been so cool and even in just what you're sharing you're like listen i'm not telling all of you to just cut your brussels sprouts and your chocolate cashews telling you to tell your <laughs> yeah. not your listeners but you better <laughs> i'm just saying to you guys like think about this and and this is the last piece side note we have to do another podcast because i want to get in a lifestyle with you and there's so many radical life like there's just so much to talk about with you but we got to feed you and get you out of here um i just want to say to the listeners you know i just think that it's so uh, well first of all thank you for being such a contributor Thank you to giving me the time, all of us the time, you know, to share all this knowledge. You are such a wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm sitting here thinking like, damn, do you need some water? Cause you were just going, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. But thank you for being a contributor to our world because whether people want to agree with you or not, or, or it's like you're here in, in the best interest of, of, of the masses of our earth, not just even humans, but like our earth. Right. And that is something that I respect so deeply. And it's something that I, I really want to acknowledge publicly. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And now please tell our listeners how they can 
tune into you, stay up to date with you, all that good stuff. And everything will be in the show notes, including your book and all that. Yeah, probably the best place to find me is carnivoremd.com. One-stop shop, carnivoremd.com. I have a podcast, Fundamental Health. I'm on all the socials at carnivoremd, and my book is called The Carnivore Code, and standing in front of us, it's laying in front of us. Yes, it is. And it's out mid-February, and it is highly referenced, over 600 references, and all these ideas and more are in there, and I hope you guys will check it out. Let me know what you think. I'll definitely be sharing it when it's available. So. Awesome. Thank you. All right, let's get you a steak. <sighs> Just twist my arm. <laughs> Later, guys. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning into this episode, you guys. If you loved it, please share it on your social. Throw it up on your Instagram stories and tag me. I'm at Black Belt Beauty. I am also at Roxy Look, R O X Y L O O K. I love connecting with you guys. This is a conversation that I want to just continue growing with you guys. So if you feel inspired to hit me up, do so in that space. I always enjoy hearing from you. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by rating it and reviewing it via iTunes. It's such supportive help, you guys. It really helps the visibility of this podcast. So I appreciate and thank you in advance for doing that. And last but not least, if you you are interested in starting your own podcast or perhaps you already have one and you need help with you know editing your audio and the production of it I cannot recommend my producers enough resonate recordings you guys they are the bomb I rely on them they are an absolute supportive tool to me and my podcast so check them out and let them know that Black Belt Beauty sent you and on that note you guys I'm signing off with all my love and always looking forward to catching you on the next